That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> the people at the house are crazy. I'm all right. Yeah. Then, you know, it's, 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 it's all day right. yesterday, all from here on there is people talking. Besides the putting up hay, the feeding, the corn, you know, that's fine. I'm quite awake. No, I was too.
Please be seated, folks. We're back on the record after our evening recess. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. When we uh, recessed yesterday, Detective Brannigan was on the stand, and Detective, I see you in the back. I'd ask you to retake the stand, please. I also understand uh, from visiting with counsel that the Mr. Forney may have a few more follow-up questions. That's correct, Judge. Uh, Very we'll briefly. Conclude with that before we move to cross. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Detective Brannigan, I know we had a long day yesterday and went over a lot of evidence. And there, towards the end of your testimony, um, I had handed you Exhibit Six. And you'd stated that you believed that the Sub One Two number was Eileen's. Did you have a chance to? Uh, or an opportunity to review your file and refresh your recollection of that? I did. Okay. May I approach, Judge? You may. I'm handing you Exhibit 6, which has already been received as evidence. Mm -hmm. Can you read this number right here? 712-314-1583. And whose number is that? That is Eileen. Uh, Eileen who? Eileen Gowan. I'm handing you Exhibit 6A, which has been received into evidence. Can you read this number here? 402-812-1247. And whose number is that? That is Ivan Samuel Brammer. And is he the defendant? He is the defendant. <clears throat> no further questions. Cross. Thank you. That was just a momentary that you, you elapsed, right? Uh, that is correct. And I think it embarrassed you a little bit, but that's normal, right? It happens. It happens. Okay. Sergeant Roberts is head of missing persons, right? Uh, I don't know if he's head of missing persons, but he and uh, Sergeant Foch, who is the afternoon shift sergeant, share that responsibility. So when a missing persons case comes in, he's called or Foch is called, John Foch? They receive the reports and they follow up on them. Okay. Do the same detectives work for them as would work in uh, CID? Yes. Right. It's just you kind of mix it up, but the person in charge it would be Roberts or Folk. That is correct. Okay. And you are retired now, but prior to your retirement, you would, would you consider yourself to be the um, 
most experienced murder investigator? Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I think that there's a, a, a lot of experience in CID at the time that I was there. Who, who else is there that had the kind of experience you had? Well, uh, there was Detective Andrews who had uh, quite a bit of experience. He was he was still there. He's now retired as well. There's Detective Springman who has uh, uh, been on the department as long as I have and has been a uh, detective as long as I have. He has had uh, quite a bit of experience. It's, according to the notes, though, it, it appears that at some point in time they felt that there was some uh, exigency that needed to take place, and that's when they brought you in as lead detective. Uh, that is correct. Uh, that, yes. And and when would you have gotten the notice that you were going to be moved in to being lead detective of this case? It would have been uh, February 23rd. But you did your first interview on what day? Uh, February 17th. Right. Yet you weren't lead detective at that point in time, right? Uh, that's correct. I was not lead detective. We just considered to be a detective then. Yes, I was uh, uh, assisting uh, among several other detectives who were assisting Sergeant Roberts. And at that point in time, everybody was supposed to give their reports to Sergeant Roberts, right? Uh, that, when they do their reports, it's filed into a... A central system, and uh, it would be the lead, the lead's responsibility to yeah to follow up on those, make sure that those reports are done, and know what the contents of those reports are. Is it also the lead's person's responsibility to make sure that everything done has a report? Uh, yes, and that's pretty much standard policy for your department. If you're given an assignment, you follow up with a supplemental report or a report. Yes, that's correct. And you follow that religiously, right? I do. Would you say everybody in your apartment does that too? I would like to believe that. Okay. Since you later on became lead in this case, have you had an opportunity to make sure that everybody did that in this particular case? Well, it, it, since I came in late and the case had already been started, it, it's a unique situation. Um, I'm able to review the case file at a later time and see what is there. I was not uh, aware, I, I don't know what everybody was doing up to that point until I became lead and I began directing the investigation. So I honestly, I, I don't know if someone was given a task prior to the 23rd and whether or not they completed a report on that task. Well, let's go through the things that you would know. Okay. Are you aware of all interviews of the defendant? Yes. And every one of those have a report? Yes. Okay. Are you aware of the interviews of the lay people? Yes. The, I'm aware of the, uh, those that, that I conducted. Um, and then there's, there's some other, uh, uh, interviews that I read the statements of, yes. Is there anyone out there that there wouldn't have been a report on after they were talked to by a police officer that you can think of? Objection, speculation. Overruled. You can answer if you know. I, I do not know if uh, someone spoke with a police officer or if they didn't complete a report on it. I may not have, uh, been aware of it. Well, I mean, going through the reports, I mean, I, I looked through them, too, and when it says, uh, go talk to... Objection here, say. What's that? Let's, let's have the question finished, and then uh, Detective Brannigan, I um, instruct you not to answer until I have an opportunity to rule on the, on the objection. Just read the front of the report, Your Honor. That's the problem with the question is going to have a hearsay answer. I don't have any report in front of me, Judge, and all that I'm reading from. Mr. Reedy finishes his question, and I'll make a ruling. As lead detective, you are pretty much aware of what's going on. Pretty much. Is that a fair statement? 
That's fair. In looking back at reports, did you notice anything that you weren't kept informed about? Objection ambiguous. Overruled. The witness can answer the question if they understand the question. Um, I want to make sure I understand the question. Could you could you re <laughs> restate it? I guess in looking at all the reports and when you got into the case, I'm assuming you went back and looked at some things and you tried to bring yourself up to speed. Is that a fair statement? Yes, that's correct. And in doing so, you were looked and said, oh, Robert's told somebody to do this. And you would then look for a report and there'd be that one, right? No, not necessarily. When uh, uh, If the supervisor gives a detective a direction uh, or a task to complete, uh, I wouldn't there wouldn't be a report of him giving that task to that detective. Um, so I guess I, I, I'm sorry, I guess I'm not following what, what well, you're... In Robert's report, he says, I told Brannigan to do this. Okay, all right, okay, now I'm following you. All right. Yes. So then you'd see that, and then you'd look for Brannigan's report. Correct. In this case, you wouldn't have to look very hard, right? You don't, you know what was in. I know what's in my report, yes, sir. But that's pretty much how the whole process goes, right? Yes, correct. So he's keeping kind of almost a log, not necessarily a log, but he's in his reports. He's saying, "I said do this," and they did it. Yes. Anything that you saw in the reports that wasn't followed up on that you felt should have been? And this is an okay one to say, I don't know. Yeah, I, I just I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm running through all the, what I can of the reports in my mind, and I'm just not, uh, I'm not finding uh, in my memory anything. Okay. Um, all right, let's... Mr. Bramlin was arrested three different times. Is that a fair statement? Or a complaint was filed against him? First, for the eluding. Correct. Uh, three different times, the eluding and uh, yeah, the, the, the other charge... Do you remember what date the eluding was? 21st. And there was also a reckless driving put in there? That's correct. And he had, a, I believe, a $500 bond, and he bonded out. And that was cash only, right? Uh, I think the bond was a little bit more than that. I, I initially thought that it was uh, lower when we were talking, but uh, I wasn't aware of that second. Uh, it, there were two, and it ended up being 1000 I think. Okay, 500 on each one. Sure. Okay, and, and he bonded out, and that was cash only, though, right? That's correct. All right. And then later on, he got arrested for, the second time he got arrested, what did he get arrested for then? Abuse of a corpse and theft. And did he bond out on that one? No. And he, then the third thing he got arrested for, or the complaint filed, which would be an arrest, what was that for? That was for murder, second degree. Do you remember the dates of the uh, charges on the abusive corpse, approximately? Yeah, early March. And the murder charge itself came down in May? Um, no, I'm, I'm trying to refresh. I'm trying to remember now. I think the, uh, the first... The charges that I filed were later, and then the uh, murder charge was after I was off on uh, on leave. Um, I can't remember the date. I'm, I apologize. The first time you saw uh, the defendant would have been on the 17th of February? That's correct. Did you make any observation about any scratches, cuts, or anything on him? Not at the time. There wasn't any, was there? Not that I recall. Right. 
part of your job is to look at that and, and recall it, right? Yes. And so when you say you didn't recall, it's because they weren't there. Correct. I noticed in tracking the vehicle, uh, we go through Burger King at 1030, and then we jump to 1056. Was there any reason there was such a large gap there? I think that the other uh, uh, positions that we had them throughout the city just weren't mentioned. But there were other places? Yes. So it was almost a constant watching of his vehicle, right? Uh, I wouldn't say constant, but uh, regular. Four to five block interviews? That type of thing? Um, so, I mean, that's some further than others, uh, but, but ongoing. What is, when you refer to it as flock, what is flock? Uh, that's the name of the system that, uh, that the City of Council Bluffs utilizes. And that videotapes, um, excuse me, traffic as it goes by? Uh, yeah, I don't. I can't tell you if it videotapes it, but we are able to get snapshots. And we learned yesterday when you were on the stand is that you're able to put in the parameters saying I want a black vehicle and have it search for vehicles and stuff. Correct. Right. Right. Omaha has the same system, right? No. What do they have? I don't know what Omaha has. Well, we've been involved in a case, I believe, where they, going over the interstate, where they were able to track a vehicle going over the interstate, right? Um, we would be able to track a vehicle going over the interstate using our, uh, using DOT. The state of Iowa has cameras throughout uh, the interstate systems. They used to, you know, maintain visual for traffic problems or whatever they uh, whatever they need, but we have utilized the DOT cameras at times, and there are DOT cameras on the bridge. And there's DOT from Nebraska, they have the same the same abilities. Yes, I would, yeah, there are. Well, I think we've been involved, you and I have been involved in cases that involved a vehicle going across that, and they were able to track it on the other side, on the Nebraska side. Yes. Okay. Why didn't you do that in this case? Uh, we we did uh, we did try. This was now that the, I was not lead investigator. I was just privy of this information uh, because I was in the room when uh, the sergeant was talking about it. But uh, they did reach out to Omaha Police Department, and Omaha Police Department did canvas the area in, in Omaha and were unable to locate any video. Doesn't that seem strange? Because you had video at 40th and Broadway. Yes, sir. And then within minutes, they would be on the Nebraska side, so you would know where they're coming and the time. Yes, we uh, we were unable to get DOT video uh, because of the time limit that they have storage. So we didn't. We were unable to request that video from DOT by the time we uh, uh, had the information and needed to get the information. Uh, I think there was a miscommunication, and uh, when that information was requested from the DOT, it had already expired and overwritten. So, I, are we talking that on the fifteenth you asked for it, or do you, do we know when we asked? Uh, no, I think uh, I think we asked for it in late February, um, but I can't tell you what the date was. I just know that uh, we we literally missed the cutoff day by by one day when we right. requested it. So the the ones you got from Iowa, you guys got on it right away and got, and then you went back and said, well, let's see if we can get Nebraska's, and they said, nope, you're too late. We never requested anything from Nebraska. That that is what. Uh, uh, what they were attempting to do, and and again, I was just privy of the conversation. I just overheard them talking about it. I don't know the details of that. I just know that the response was there was no video available. Okay. Well, years ago, that's the response we used to get from the police department on that. Your video, right? That, you, that we had none. I can't comment on that years ago. I, I Unfortunately, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. 
how do we know the times on these videos are correct? Well, they're, they're going to be within a minute or two on the, if you're talking about the public works cameras, uh, uh, they're uh, maintained by public works. We don't have any control over that, but uh, we know that uh, those cameras for the most part are, uh, are within a seconds or a minute. Hey. That was a lot of, for the most parts, we, we know that type of thing, but you believe they're accurate, the government ones? Yes. How about when you get to, like, Burger King? Yeah, that's, that's a hard, uh, hard thing to do. Different people uh, have different systems. Some systems are more accurate than others. Uh, I have a watch that, uh, that I have to reset the time about every four or five months because it's creeped up about a minute. So I have to reset it uh, back about a minute, but I, my car, I have to reset the clock in, in my car about twice a year, not because of daylight savings time, but because it just creeps up. Mm -hmm. it, uh, so, I mean, it's an electronic device. Electronic devices are all different. There's different quality levels. Uh, sometimes the, the time doesn't stay completely accurate. You have to reset it. Uh, well, and, and one yeah. of the things, Sugar said they don't bother to do daylight savings times. Right. Uh, Megan told me, uh, Megan is the, is the manager, uh, part owner of Sugar's, uh, that she is not uh, good at electronics, and she did not set it. She doesn't like to mess with it, so she just left it. Okay. Any idea whether New Horizons is good down their clocks? I didn't talk to them. Uh, by looking at the video and knowing the times on the other videos, I think it's pretty accurate. How about John's Auto? I'm sorry? John's Auto. John's Auto had no time stamps. So we're guessing at what times on his? Uh, yeah, uh, basically they gave us a, uh, a block of time. From, I mean, they know what the times are. It's just not time stamped on the video. Uh, so they, when they provided blocks of time, uh, and I did not receive that uh, that video. That was prior to my coming onto the the case. But uh, as I understand it, they would send in blocks of video at uh, I think it was 15 minute intervals, and they would, and it was specified from this time to this time. Uh, so that's where. The time frame was they were able to narrow that down based upon what they believe they gave you correct All right again it's you're asking a business to go back through their records pull stuff out and give you a time frame and if they are off they're off that that's correct and they try their best but we don't know that that is correct Mr. Rammer's phone was given to the FBI, correct? Or downloaded for him? Uh, no, I don't think that uh, we provided them with the phone download. I know we provided them with the uh, records that came from T-Mobile. 
Well, I remember sitting and watching on one of the interviews, uh, and they asked him for his phone, and he gave that to him during the interview. That would have been the Council Plus Police Department. Okay. Oh, but don't you guys share that information? If it's asked for, yes, we would. Well, you asked them to do a cast investigation, right? That is correct. Wouldn't you have shared whatever you had with them? We would have shared the uh, the information from the search warrant results uh, from T-Mobile. Did you um, ask for anybody else's phone or did you get a search warrant for anybody else's phone? We didn't need to get a uh, search warrant for anyone else's phone. We had uh, permission to download the other phones. Well, you also had it from Mr. Brammer. At least he did it on video that we saw. Um, Brammer is who we're talking about. Is that correct? The defendant? Well, there's Brammer, the there's Brockman, there's correct. Um, several different phones, right? But yeah. And he voluntarily gave you his phone. He was cooperative on that. Okay. Uh, I think we're talking, I think there was a miscommunication there. Uh, the, the question I thought you were asking was specifically about the download of the defendant's phone uh -huh. and providing that to the FBI. Is that correct? Eventually it got to them, right? I don't know. I, I did not provide that to them. All right. But a constable as police officer asked for his and he voluntarily handed it to him, right? We asked the defendant for his phone to download for us, yeah. not for the FBI. And he gave that to you, and he also gave you his password, right? Yes, that's correct. During your interviews, he, he repeatedly said things like, check the phone where I'm, where I'm at, right? Yes. Can you think of any ever any efforts that were made by your police department, your officers, detectives, or on your behalf that hasn't been testified to or that there isn't a report on? Can you think of anything? That, you know, that, that's one of those things of trying to prove a negative. I'm, I'm, no, uh, I don't... Uh, because you make your best effort to put a report down for everything you do, right? I do. And so if you were involved in it, there would be a report? Yes. Okay. From your experience, Sergeant Roberts, is he as careful? Uh, I'd like to think so. Okay. I, I can't say yes or no. Okay. Nothing further than that. Redirect. Thank you, Judge. Just a couple questions here. Detective Brannigan, on February 17th, you stated that you were in the interview with um, the defendant and Sergeant Roberts, correct? That's correct. Okay. And at that time, you testified that you were not the lead investigator, correct? That is correct. And you were there to assist? Yes. And at that same time, were there other other officers with Council Bluffs Police Department assisting in the investigation? Yes, there were. Uh, can you give an approximate number? Was it a few? Was it a lot? Besides, besides me, uh, off the top of my head, I can think of five other officers. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned that regarding the murder charge that you were off on leave. That is correct. Okay, let's talk about that. Why were you off on leave? Uh, I had surgery on my shoulder, my right shoulder. Okay, and were you also were you also um, getting ready for retirement? I was. And did you have vacation days built up? I did. And did you use those vacation days? I did. And was that part of your on leave? Yes. Now the defend the defendant. Eventually, after a few interviews, 
admitted that he went to Omaha, correct? That is correct. And he stated that he went to a convenience store called Four Aces to purchase cigarettes. That is correct. Because they were cheap. Yes. Did law enforcement ever try to find the location of which Four Aces? Uh, we attempted to get the information from the defendant. Uh, we still weren't absolutely sure which, uh, which location he went to uh, just because of just because of the nature of the interviews. And uh, so we went to both of them and requested video from both locations. And did you get any video from those locations? We received the video from the south locations off of uh, Leavenworth and the uh, one on North 30th, uh, they did not cooperate. <coughs> okay, on the one that did cooperate, did you see the defendant on the video? No, we did not. Just a clarification, you... The law enforcement applied for search warrants for the the phone records for Eileen Gowan's phone and also the defendant, uh, Ivan Brammer's phone, correct? That is correct. And when you received the results of the search warrant, when the, you received those results, did you then give those results to the FBI? Yes, I did. Not the phone dump? No, not the phone. Because that, that's something different, right? That is something completely different. That's the contents that's on the phone. Correct. No further questions, Judge. Thank you, Detective Brannigan. You're excused and released from any subpoena. State may call the next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Sergeant Ty Boldra. Sergeant Boulder. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good. Have you raised your right hand to be sworn? Please swear or affirm the testimony about you will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Please be seated. Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Could you state your name and spell your last name for the record, please? My name is Ty Boulder. Last name is spelled B-O-L-D-R-A. And uh, how are you currently employed? I am a sergeant with the Council Bluffs Police Department. How long uh, have you been employed by the police department? A little over 16 years. Okay. Um, any prior law enforcement or military experience? Uh, five years military police officer with the U.S. Army. Okay. Um, and then how long have you been a sergeant? Well, um, not quite a year yet. Okay. Um, back in um, um, February, um, were you a sergeant at that time? Yes. Okay. Uh, on February 19th, uh, did you have occasion to, uh, to get called to a welfare check involving the defendant, uh, Sam Bramer? Yes. Okay. Uh, tell us about how you got involved in that. Um, there was call in reference to a suicidal party in the area of um, 13th and H, and while checking that area, I located Mr. Bramer and his um, blue Ford F-150 on a lot of Kicker's Bar. Okay. And uh, did you have your, um, your body cam on during your interactions with Mr. Bramer? Yes. All right. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 5I. Uh, do you recognize this? Yes. And is this a copy of your body cam video? Yes. And is that your uh, signature uh, or initials uh, on that? That is. Offer 5I. Any objection to 5I? No objection, Your 5I is received. Request permission to publish it. Uh, you may. Uh, let me give a brief. Uh, further instruction to the jury. As I mentioned yesterday, and you'll um, probably hear from me again or certainly read from me again, uh, statements and questions uh, by law enforcement officers or other investigators uh, during interviews with the defendant are not evidence to be considered for their truth. The defendant's answers and responses to those questions and statements are evidence. And with that, you may play the we need to get our screens up here. You need me to do that. Yeah.
Hi, sir. How are you? Yeah. Is this your vehicle? Yes. Hey, can I talk to you real quick? Yeah. Do you have any weapons or anything on you? No. Okay. Hey, um, can you keep your hands out of your pockets? Yeah. Thank you. Um, we were called to check your work. Could just... Again, I haven't patted you down, so I just don't want you to reach for in your pockets for weapons or anything, but we were called to check your welfare. Okay, I think you talked to your granddaughter earlier, and she was concerned about you, some of the statements that you made to her. I'm here for you, man. Tell me what's going on. What, what, well, why, hey, are you, why are you feeling the way you're feeling? <laughs> My girlfriend, it was like a week ago, me and her broke up, and she moved in with a guy. And apparently, he supposedly he raped her. What's his name? Uh, the only thing I know, he goes by Mike. You don't know Mike's last name? No, uh, Mike B. But anyway... Where, where's that at? Where'd they move in together? Uh, it's out by... Uh, oh, shit. Down by uh, Sugars. Like two miles from Sugars. Me and her broke up. She didn't have a place to go. She moved in with him. She told me Friday that he tried to mess with her. So I called my son and see if he can move back in because he kicked us out. So I called my son and see if he can move back in with her. And then uh, I went to his house, got her stuff, took her to my son's. And then the next morning we went to work and then she went right back to him. So I don't know. And so you've been to the house before to pick up property and pick her up? No, that's the first time I've ever been there. Right, but you've yeah. been there before. Do you remember how to get there? Mm, no, not really, because when I took her, she was half drunk. And I didn't she was drunk, out. but you weren't drunk, right? So you should be able to remember where you went? No, she just told me to go two miles. I went two miles, and then she told me to turn around, and I came back. She was turn here, and I turned there, and that's when she went in and got her stuff. And then I took her to her son's house, and... Uh, Next morning, I took her to work. You took her to her son's house, you said? No, his house. My son's house. You took him, took her to your son's house. Right. And then the next morning, I went and picked her up from my son's, and then took her to work. And then that morning, I told her, as soon as I get off work, I'll come and get you at my son's, and we'll go find a place for you to stay. Because my granddaughter said she couldn't live there no more. So where does she work? What's that? Where does she work, your girlfriend? At Sugar's. Okay, so you dropped her off at work, and then you didn't see her after that? I dropped her off at work. I had to work that morning. And then I took her from there to uh, her son come picked her up from Sugars, went to my son's house. She grabbed her stuff, went right back to the same guy, supposedly raped her. So how, how did you find that out? She told me. She texted me. Okay. And she's been missing since uh, Monday. They're trying to locate her right now. Okay. So what comments did you make to your granddaughter that would, would be concerning this evening? I just told her I'm going to go out and have a couple of drinks and that I love her. That's it. Okay. Did you mention something about seeing Grandma tonight? What's that? Did you mention something about seeing Grandma tonight? No. Uh -huh. No. Okay. Well, I want you to understand I, I, I'm here for you. Right. Okay. And so, if you're feeling like you need to talk to somebody, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Yeah. We're human, okay? And sometimes we get in places where we get some significant news or we're concerned about somebody and we start to have some feelings where we're worried about them. Yeah. And sometimes, like I said, you just need to talk to a professional. Yeah. Well, I'm going to call my granddaughter and have her come pick me up anyway. Okay. Um, I would like for you to talk to somebody tonight. I would like for you to talk. To a medical professional. To who? To a medical professional. Yeah. About what you said to your granddaughter, which is concerning enough that there's now three or four police officers standing here talking to you. Yeah. Okay? Because they're concerned about your welfare. <coughs> okay? So that's what I would like you to do. Okay? I don't want to have to drag you up to the hospital, but I most certainly will. I think based off of what the granddaughter has told us tonight and kind of the... Or she call you? Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, so she was she was crying when we went to the doctor. I mean, that's she's oh she's really? Still, yes, she, she was very ex emotional. She, her best friend and aunt are currently at the apartment because of what you said. Wow.
So is that something you can do for us? Can you talk to somebody up at the hospital about how you're feeling really tonight? No, I'm just going to call my granddaughter and have her come and get me. Okay. Do you have any weapons on you? No. Uh, okay. Uh, can you push your hand I'm up here? I can't. I can't afford it. I, I'm, I'm just going to pat you down real quick. I want to make sure you don't have any weapons, okay? Yeah. Get a lighter. Yeah. Oh, I got my little hot on my side plate right there. Okay. You're free. It's kind of hard to read the menu when you're... Okay. Is this a key to your truck in your pocket? Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said... Based off of what they have told me tonight, I'm going to give you one or two options. You can go up willingly. Go where? You can go up willingly and talk to a medical professional tonight. Okay. Or I can take you up there and you'll stay there for 72 hours. Okay? I can't have my granddaughter come no. to me? No. Based off of what you've told us and what's going on in your life right now, yeah. you need to talk to somebody. I don't think that we will be doing our due diligence to do our job to make sure that you're not going to hurt yourself based off of what's going on in, with you and your girlfriend, right. okay, I, you, you need to talk to somebody tonight, okay? And so the best course of action is to go up to the hospital, your choice, to go to talk to somebody about it tonight. <clears throat> so we're going to leave that up. Basically, the only option is this. You're going to the hospital. Pick your hospital you want to go to. That's fine. Okay. By your choice or ours, Okay. That's basically the options, okay? The keys, are they sitting in here or are they in your pocket? Uh, I think they're in my pocket. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the keys yeah, off the cigarette sure. real quick. Sure. You want to walk over there? Which cruiser is Yeah, let me lock it up. I'll lock it up. I don't know that you have a firearm and I don't want you jumping in your vehicle. Right Seriously? Seriously. That's a little firearm. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't know you. I've never I met know. you, so I, I just want to make sure that... Just hold my door and push that button and I'm, I'll be good. Roll your window. Yeah, well, oh, roll, crap, roll yeah, your window. Roll your window. Is it manual? I need you to step. No, it's electric. I'm gonna do it. Okay. Oh. Because okay. I grab my cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. Which cruiser is you gonna go in? Okay. You can smoke your cigarette and you can walk on over to this cruiser. I'm just gonna lock the door. I'm not okay. doing anything else. Okay. All right. I might have to help you roll that window up. I just don't want you standing right behind oh, me at the moment, okay? <laughs> and your cell phone is where? Here, right there by the front seat. Stop. He doesn't want you walking Okay, you're fine. No, I was going to show where my cell phone is. It should be right. <laughs> yeah, I don't, want you, I, I don't want you reaching okay. in the truck, okay? All right, raise that arm okay. rest up and my phone should be right there. Okay, thank you. Shit, there it is. This right here? No, no. Raise it up again, all the way. Oh, I see it. Yep. Right, there you go. There we go. And then you turn your ignition key on and hit the. Can you hold on that for a second? Yep, I'll get it. I can. I know. I know how to roll up a window, pal. Thank you. There you go. Watch your fingers. Don't get yeah, it. Yeah. So oh, you, you can finish your smoke in your cigarette, but like I said, we're going to go for a ride here anyway, so. What am I under arrest for? You're not under arrest, sir. Nope. This is, a, this is clearly, it's just because of the statements you made. It's basically what we call a, 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 a transport for medical purposes. For psychological purposes, you need an evaluation is all, Okay. Now, like I said, if you refuse to go with us, then it'll be an emergency committal and you'll be up there for 72 hours. All right? But like I said, if you're making statements to harm yourself, to family members... Well, I would never do that. Well, that's, that's not what was said, okay? So that's our concern. And, and I think kind of what's going on with your background with, with your girlfriend may, may have put you kind of in that position to where you're feeling... That's my granddaughter. You're worried. I mean, with that news, like you said, with her being raped and some of this, maybe she's ran around with another guy. I mean, that may make you feel suicidal. I mean, it's certainly possible. You know what I mean? And, I, and you're not in any trouble right now. It's just 
We're concerned about you, so we just want you to go up and talk to a medical professional. Which hospital do you go to? Uh, probably Jenny. Is this just a flashlight? Is that what that is? Yeah. All right, I'm just going to take that stuff there out of your pocket. We're just going to hold on to that. We'll give that back to you. Oh, here we go. This car here, this guy here knows what's going on. So then was, um, or don't play the video now, was uh, he ultimately transported to Jenny Edmondson? Yes. All right. That's all I have for you. Thank you, Sergeant. Cross. Good morning, Sergeant Bolger. Good morning, sir. This was not your first interaction on February 19th with the case involving Eileen Gowan, was it? Yes. It was? Yes. You didn't take a report from a Caleb Moore on February 16th? I had a tip, I believe, and I don't remember which day that was on that came into the sergeant's office. But it was in reference to um, somebody being seen, who they believed was Eileen, I think, on the west end of town. So you did then receive a tip that Caleb Moore saw Eileen Cowan at a food pantry near 34th and Broadway uh, on the 14th of February? Correct. And that report came in on the 16th of February? Yes. Um, there was another report that Todd Stangles saw Ms. Gowan at Sam's Club on February 14th. Were you aware of this? No. Was that offered by me? No, you aren't. No. Okay. Uh, were you aware that uh, CBPD also had a report that Ms. Gowan was in St. Tammany's Parish, Louisiana? Your Honor, I'm going to object to all this would be speculation on his behalf. He's just reading off a litany of potential tips. Um, person to ask these questions of would have been Detective Brannigan. If he followed up on any of these tips and they have something to do with something he did, I think he can ask that question. But having him just narrate various uh, uh, tips, he's just saying hearsay um, at this point. The objection sustained at this point, if you can lay a foundation that uh, Sergeant Baldra may have received some tips, you're welcome to ask him questions about that. I was asking if he was aware, Judge. I wasn't saying anything else. But the objection is sustained if um, Mr. Baldra received tips and you're aware of that in some report, by all means, you can ask the question, otherwise not. Uh, Sergeant, you we saw that you were able to get in that vehicle on February 19th, correct? Yes. Did you note any blood or anything in the vehicle while you were in there? Nothing that I was, I was not looking for blood, and so no, I didn't see anything that I was paying attention that stuck out to me, no. But you had your flashlight, and you know, you might have been able to notice some blood if, if there's a large pool of blood in there, correct? Sure. But you didn't notice any blood or anything suspicious while you were in the vehicle? I, again, I grabbed a phone, locked it up, and that was it. No, I didn't see anything. On the last part of the video, you mentioned that uh, Ted wanted to come up and, and talk to uh, Mr. Brammer. Uh, is that Sergeant Roberts that wanted to go and talk to him? Correct. So you obviously knew that Sergeant Boulder wanted to speak with Mr. Brammer, not necessarily about this psychological intervention. I think you meant Sergeant uh, Roberts. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Sergeant Roberts. Why you restate the question? I apologize. So you knew that Sergeant Roberts was interested in talking to Mr. Brammer uh, not regarding a psychological evaluation, correct? So when I was en route to the call, I received a call, and I don't remember if it was from, it had it been from Detective Foch, or not Foch, I'm sorry, um, Sergeant Roberts, um, in reference to 
this individual, uh, Mr. Brammer, um, and he said that he needed to speak to him because he was the last person that had seen his girlfriend. So, yes. All right. Thank you, Sergeant. I have no further questions. Any redirect? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Sergeant, you are excused and released from any subpoena. Next witness, State. Uh, Officer Brad Wright. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Could you state your name, spell your last name for the record, please? It's Brad Wright, and that's W-R-I-G-H-T. All right. And how are you currently employed? Uh, uniform Division, uh, Street Patrol, Council Bluffs. All right. And how long have you been a police officer with Council Bluffs? 34 years. Um, at some point um, on uh, February 21st, uh, did you have occasion to have an encounter that involved the defendant in this case, Sam Bramer? Yes, I did. All right. Tell us how you uh, became involved in that encounter. I was uniform patrol, and I was in the west end, southern end parking lot of the Walmart, and I heard Detective Fletcher state that he is trying to make contact with a person of interest and a missing person and that person had taken off and he was trying to get the guy to stop. Okay. So this comes out to you as sort of a pursuit call? Yes. That's right. correct. So what did you do in response? Uh, myself and Officer Huey, who I was speaking with in the other cruiser, headed to that location. I went down Nash Boulevard and came to 25th Street and I was listening to Detective Fletcher say which way they're going, speeds, going through stop signs. The guy wasn't stopping. I continued southbound on 25th Street until I got to Avenue A. All right. And what did you see when you got to Avenue A? When I got to Avenue A, I heard over the radio that the subject was southbound on 28th Street, and now he's headed eastbound on Avenue A, coming my direction. Okay. And then did you at some point make uh, visual contact with him? Yes, I did. I pulled out onto Avenue A and approached the vehicle. He was coming at me. He passed a vehicle. I activated my top lights. He made a left-hand turn, which would have put him going northbound on 26th Street. I hit the siren, and I gave pursuit. Okay, so you had you were in your marked cruiser? Yes, sir. And you had lights and sirens going? Yes. All right. And did the uh, the vehicle then uh, pull over in response to your no, lights? No, it did signs? not. It was accelerating across uh, control, uncontrolled intersections, blowing stop signs, and he continued northbound until he got to Avenue G. Okay. Um, at some point, um, were you ordered to terminate the pursuit? Yes, when we got to Avenue G, the vehicle turned left, which was west. He was going westbound in Avenue G, and I was following him. Still lights and sirens going in about 31st or 32nd Street. The sergeant gave the order to go ahead and terminate the pursuit. All right. As part of the reasons for those orders uh, to terminate is worried about potential for damage to... Damage to innocent. civilian people. Sure. Okay. Um, was your uh, cruiser uh, camera operating during this pursuit? Yes, they were. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 18. Um, is this a uh, copy of your cruiser cam? It would be. And is that your initials? My uh, initials and my officer number. Okay. Offer 18. Any objection to 18? No, Your Honor. No objection. 18 is received. You may.
Are you still behind it? It's turning westbound on C for the 27. Shut it down, shut it down. Was that you were given the directive to terminate yes, pursuit? Yes, terminate to pursuit. Okay. Um, as a result of that encounter, um, did you apply for a couple of arrest warrants? Yes, I did. Uh, Detective Fletcher stated that the driver was, I believe, Ivan Bramer, and I, they asked me to apply for the two warrants or for the two traffic charges. I applied for warrants for reckless driving and eluding. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Any cross? Yes, Your Honor. So you had conversations with Officer Fletcher? After the pursuit, yes, sir. Okay. And you were aware that this all started when Officer Fletcher approached Mr. Brammer and said, I want to talk to you? He stated there was a person of interest that was fleeing from him and requested assistance. And Mr. Brammer told him he didn't want to talk to him, that he talked to him enough? I don't know what was spoken, sir. Okay. But the pursuit all occurred after Mr. Brammer just said, I don't want to talk to you. Objection. Uh, he just said he didn't know what he said. Sister. So you were pursuing him based on nothing then? No, it was an officer requesting assistance to stop a person who was fleeing from him. Okay. Fleeing from him, that's what you were told? That's what the radio traffic stated, yes, sir. Was there any other radio traffic? There's quite a bit of radio traffic as far as which direction the vehicle was fleeing from us. De Detective Fletcher. Okay. Nothing further. May redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you. 
Officer Wright, you are released from any uh, Thank you. You may be excused. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, let's take a uh, mid-morning recess. Please remember that admonition I've given to you. Don't talk about this case. Keep an open mind, and thank you for not using your cell phones. We'll be in recess for 15 minutes. We'll try to be back on the record at quarter of 11. Sounds to me like we will get through, we have roughly five witnesses left, we'll probably get through maybe as many as three before lunch and then come back after lunch for a couple witnesses. That sounds about right. And everyone else is scheduled for tomorrow, the two experts, and... And we'll rest. All right. Okay. I'll see you all at quarter of 11.
ready for the jury? Yes, Judge. Mike's on then? Yes. Please be seated, folks. We're back on the record after our mid-morning recess. The state may call their next witness. Judge, the state would call Deputy Zach Norman. Good morning, Deputy Norman. Good morning. Can you raise your right hand before? Can you swear or affirm the testimony about the deal, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. Please be seated. Counsel. Would you please state your full and complete name and spell it, please? Yes, it's uh, Zachary Norman, spelling is Z-A-C-H-A-R-I-E, last name Norman, N-O-R-M-A-N. And where are you occupied? I work for the Pottawatomie County Sheriff's Office as a road patrol deputy attached to the K-9 division. What experience do you have? Uh, I've worked there for a little over 10 years. Um, my experience, I've, I've worked the road patrol division that, that whole time. Um, I'm a member of the ERT squad and I'm a technical collision investigator as well. Did you have occasion to get a dispatch to 152nd Old Mormon Bridge on February 26, 2023? That's correct. And at that time, did you know why you were being dispatched there? I believe they said over dispatch that uh, a possible body had been located. And did you go to 152nd Old Mormon Bridge? I did. And what did, what's the first thing you saw when you got to the scene? Uh, I saw a van that was parked in the middle of the roadway um, with two gentlemen uh, that were there um, in or around the van. I approached them. They advised that they had located a body. Uh, in the ditch. Um, their words were that at first they thought maybe it was a Halloween decoration, uh, but upon further inspection they determined it was a body. So from there I went over to look at the body, determined that it, that was in fact what it was. Um, and then after you know my, my kind of initial observations I went in, made up the appropriate calls, and then started to secure the scene. Can you describe the body that you saw? Yeah, she was in the ditch. Um, there was a small amount of snow around her. Uh, she was in what I would describe as a slight case of decomposition, and she had some obvious lividity. Um, and when I say a state of decomp, she had, if I remember correctly, the right side of her face was missing. You could see down to the skull, her orbital, bo orb correction, orbital bone. Um, and uh, like I said, she had lividity. And she was Sorry. laying on her side. Did you observe any obvious injuries? Yeah. Uh, again, her face, um, unbeknownst to me, I'm not sure what caused it, but it was missing. The skin was gone. You could see, uh, you could see her skull and the internals of her, her eye socket. And uh, I observed what 
appeared to be in my initial observation just what I what I would call it appeared to be a ligature mark on her neck um, mid throat around the thyroid area now did she have clothes on she did okay. were you aware of a missing persons investigation related to Eileen Gowan I was time? yes okay and what what did, you, what did you know at that time there have been uh, bulletins that were put out about uh, Eileen. Um, there was an email that was sent out uh, to members of our office that, that maybe some of her family members were going to be looking in a certain area, if I remember correctly, along Railroad Highway. Uh, being as I have a dog, I had what I would, knowing the suspect that had been listed at the time and the, the particulars that I knew, I thought I had this hunch that she would be found somewhere off of the roadway just due to the, the suspect's age and stuff. So along railroad, I took my dog out and I was trying to track underneath bridges and things of that nature. Um, and then I can't recall the specific time after that where the body was actually located on 152nd. But yes, she was known about for some time before that. Was this uh, a highly publicized missing persons case? I don't know that if it was released out to the public. I know that there were missing person releases made to the public, but outside of what details they would have known, I can't, I can't speculate to that. Were you involved in securing the scene? I was. And what, what do you do when you secure a scene? It depends on the area. It's all contextual, right? Um, but that area, it's, it's a big open area, so we tried to block both sides of the roadway and then just tape off the area that we thought would, would be involved with, you know, that, that, you know, maybe uh, 50 to 100 yards from each side of the body. Did, did any other officers arrive at the scene? They did. Um, we had multiple uh, individuals from the Council Police Department come on scene. Uh, RCSI um, Tech Hadley Kava was notified to come, as well as uh, our Sergeant of Investigation, Sergeant Jim Doty. No further questions, Judge. Any cross? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Deputy, you are excused and released from any subpoena. Thank you. Thank you. State's next witness. State calls Hadley Kaffa. State your name and spell your last name for the record, please. My name is Hadley Kava, K-A-V-A. -A. And how are you currently employed? I am the crime scene and evidence technician with the Pottawatomie County Sheriff's Office. Okay. So what we sort of commonly call CSI, that's your job? Yes. Okay. Um, in your capacity um, working uh, in CSI for the Sheriff's uh, Department or Sheriff's Office, um, did you have occasion to... Um, uh, go to the scene of a, a dead body uh, located in Pottawatomie County on February 26th of this year? Yes, I did. Okay. Tell the jury how you got involved. Um, on February 26, 2023, just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I received a request to respond to 152nd and Old Mormon Bridge Road. Um, it is located between the interstate and the town of Crescent, Iowa. I went to the scene and um, observed a dead body of a white female um, on the east side of 152nd Street um, and very clearly deceased. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure everyone sort of set the stage of the location. Um, Old Mormon Bridge Road, that's the road that really connects from the interstate to Crescent. Yes, right? that's correct. That's the main road. And then about halfway through, it gets bisected by 152nd Street? Yes, that's correct. Right, and so this was on the north side of Old Mormon Bridge Road, and you said it was on the east side of the road? I'm, I apologize. I believe 
It would have been the west side of the road. Okay. And uh, how far off of the roadway was the body located? About two feet. Okay, so right along the side of the road. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, did you uh, take a video of the scene as you arrived? I did, yes. Is that a normal procedure for you? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, may I approach, Your Honor? You may. <clears throat> I'm showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 2. Um, is this a copy of your uh, video? Yes, it is. And are those your initials? Yes, it is. Offer 2. Any objection to two? No objection. Two is received. Request permission to publish? You may. Did you also take some photos uh, while you were uh, on the scene? Yes, I did. Right. Do you take a lot of photos? Yes, I take okay. a lot of photos. All right. I'm only going to show you a few. Okay. Um, may I approach your honor? You may. Any objection to 2A, 2B, 2C? No objections. Those three exhibits, 2A, 2A, 2B, 2C, are all received. You may. All right. So first, um, have you direct your attention behind you to the, to the screen. So this is exhibit 2A. Um, is this the uh, the condition uh, of the body uh, as you uh, found it that day? Yes, it is. Okay. Looks like she's missing a shoe. Did you find a shoe in the area at all? No. We searched um, quite extensively, and we did not locate her left shoe. Okay. Um, and put up 2B. And then um, looks like we've got some snow and ice on her? Is that accurate? Is it yes. Accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, looks like the jeans are darker in spaces and then there's light right through a stripe in the middle. Is that because they were wet? Yes, they were damp. Okay. And it had it, uh, to your knowledge, had it snowed and or rained uh, during this uh, period uh, of time? Yes. Between the time she was reported missing and then the time she was found, it had snowed on a few days as well as rained, and there were some sunnier and warmer days as well. Okay. And then just I want to make sure I'm clear with this on the record before you put that up. This is all taking place in uh, Pottawatomie County here in the state of Iowa? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then uh, 2C, um, where was this taken? This was taken on the other side of the road, so the east side of 152nd Street. Okay. And was uh, this area known for having litter and trash dumped? Yes, it is a common area where people will dump trash. Okay. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Any cross? Just so you know. <coughs> <clears throat> there
there were certain items of trash that were at the scene, right? Yes, that's correct. Was any of that indicative of anything as far as the defendant? I couldn't say. Was any of it taken and analyzed? Um, it was collected and it was handed over to the custody of the Council Bluffs Police Department from there. So to your knowledge, you don't know what they did with it after that? I did not have any involvement with it after the process of collecting and packaging. No other questions, Your Honor? May I redirect? Just very briefly. And when we're talking about items that were taken, we're talking about like empty Mountain Dew cans, bush light cans, just general refuse and trash. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Nothing further. Thank you. You are excused and released from any subpoena. Thank you, sir. Thank you. State's next witness. Judge, the state would call Sergeant James Noti. Thank you. Can you state your full and complete name and spell it, please? Jim Doty, D-O-T-Y. And are you employed? Yes, with the Pottawatomie County Sheriff's Office. Um, what education do you have? I have a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in crime management and justice administration. Do you, do you have any training experience? I have uh, attended a lot of trainings and on-the-job experience since 2007. That was going to be my next question. How long have you been on the force? Since 2007. Okay. Uh, what would be your job duties as a sergeant? I supervise the investigations division. Been doing that since 2018. When did you first get involved in this case? Uh, it was February 26, 2023. I received a call from Deputy Norman informing me that uh, a female body had been found in the area of 152nd, 152nd Street. Street and uh, Mormon Bridge Road, and that's kind of their protocols to notify me anytime there's any kind of death investigation that we need to take place. Did you eventually go to the scene? Yes, I did. And did you have any knowledge at that time whether this could possibly be connected to a missing persons investigation? Uh, when Deputy Norman called me, he told me he had his suspicions that this could be uh, Eileen Gowan from a missing persons case in Council Bluffs. And were you aware of the Eileen Gowan being a missing person at that time? I was, I was slightly aware on my way there. I called uh, Sergeant Roberts with the Council's Police Department and briefed him on what uh, Deputy Norman thought, and he gave me a clothing description for her. And then uh, when I arrived at the scene, I saw that her clothing matched the description that Sergeant Roberts gave me. Did you know anything about the defendant, Samuel Brammer, at that time? On my way there, not so much. Um, when we got to the scene, Sergeant Roberts had several Council Bluffs detectives and uh, sent a crime scene tech. And uh, after briefing with them, I learned uh, some information about Mr. Brammer. Now, Council Bluffs Police Department was investigating the missing persons of Eileen, right? Yes, they were. And then after she's found on February 26th, then she's found out in the county of Pottawatomie County, correct? Yes, and that would be our jurisdiction as the sheriff's office where she was found. Out of the city limits? Yes. And so, and that's why you got involved, is that correct? Yes. And then, who took over the case at that point? Well, the morning of the 27th, the day after uh, she was discovered, we had a meeting with the Council Bluffs Police Department. Um, since they had already been doing an extensive investigation on the missing persons case, uh, thought it made more sense for them to just continue the investigation into the death and uh, we provided assistance and uh, helped them out uh, with any requests they had. And did you know at that time who the lead investigator was from Council Bluffs Police Department? Yeah, it was Detective Ron Brannigan. And did you yourself assist in the investigation? Yes, I did. And what were some of the things that you assisted with? Uh, on the 27th of February, I was informed that they received information, the Council Bluffs Police Department received information that uh, Mr. Brammer had scrapped his truck at Lakeside Auto Recyclers in Carter Lake. They asked if I would go up there and confirm that information. 
I went up there, confirmed that he had scrapped his truck on February 25th and received $750 for it. Was there a point in time when you were trying to find the defendant to have a interview with him? What's that? Was there a point in time where you tried to find the defendant to have an interview with him? Yeah, late, late April of 2023, Detective Brannigan requested that I try to make contact with Mr. Brammer uh, and speak to him about a couple things uh, regarding the case. And on May 3rd of 2023, I received a call from Mr. Brammer on my office telephone. How did he know to call you? I went to a, an apartment that uh, Council's Police Department believed he was staying at, and I left a card there on two occasions, and my card would have my office phone number on it. And so did you have a conversation with the defendant? Yes. And what did you guys talk about? Uh, we talked about, uh, the conversation lasted a little over an hour. We talked about several things. Uh, one of the things we talked about was a safe that Eileen uh, had with her on the 13th of February. Um, that Council Bluffs Police Department received information that that safe had $1,200 in it. And on the 15th of February, they had uh, bank records that Mr. Brammer had made a deposit for $1,200. So they wanted me to talk to him to determine what his knowledge was about the contents of Eileen's safe and also figure out where that $1,200 came from that he deposited. And did you, did you have that conversation with the defendant about the $1,200? I did. And what did he say? Uh, regarding the money in the safe, when we first started talking about the safe, he informed me that he did not know what was in the safe. Uh, about 53 minutes later in the conversation, we talked about the safe again, and he told me that he knew there was either six to $700 in the safe because Eileen would had to get money out of that safe to give to her daughter. And we also spoke about his $1,200 deposit that he made on February 15th. Uh, I asked him where he got that money. He told me he got it from selling tools on Facebook Marketplace, and he had some money in his pocket, and that's where that $1,200 came from. Did you have any conversation about the defendant dropping off Eileen at Mike Brockman's residence? Uh, we, I talked about that timeline a little bit. I asked, um, I was informed that he had went there and then went to a Casey's on Sherwood, and then I asked him where he went after that, and he said he went to his apartment, and I confronted him with it. We had video footage of him in Trainer after that before he had went to his apartment, and I asked him what he was doing in the area of Trainer, if he knew anybody out there or if he could remember what he was doing out there, and he had no recollection of what he was doing out there. So did he admit to going out there or not going out there? No, he didn't remember going out there. Okay. No further questions, Judge. Any cross? Because the body was found in Pottawatomie County, you became the lead detective. Is that correct? I was notified about it because the body was found in Pottawatomie County, and I'm the supervisor of the investigations division. Well, it's now a Pottawatomie County case at that point, isn't it? Uh, not necessarily. That's why I contacted Sergeant Roberts, because we had uh, suspicions that it was Eileen, and we knew that they had already been working an extensive missing persons investigation on that. Did you contact Roberts, or did you contact Brennigan? I contacted Sergeant Roberts, because he was a sergeant of investigations. Okay, but you were starting an investigation of your own, weren't you? I was driving out there, and I called Sergeant Roberts on the phone, informed him of what a deputy Norman had observed and that he believed that it was Eileen and Sergeant Roberts informed me he would be sending detectives up there and a crime scene tech also. And so we all kind of arrived within a matter of 10, 15 minutes of each other, their detectives and our detectives. I know it seems like a jurisdictional dispute here, but is it, when the body is found in Pottawatomie County, isn't it a Pottawatomie County case? It can be. Um, we've had Sometimes a state we can work cases in our county. Uh, the cities work cases. Uh, we all have the same county attorney. Um, we're all certified Iowa police officers. They have jurisdiction in Iowa, so that's why we had a meeting on the 27th that morning to figure out everybody's roles and duties in this case okay. to coordinate that effort. What was it decided your duties would be? Uh, my duties, well, I had several duties. Like I said, I went to the Lakeside Auto to confirm the scrapping of the trucks, of the truck. Um, 
I was instructed to try to make contact with Mr. Brammer at the end of April. Did you review the file? Did you come up to speed on that? The Which file? The, the Council Bluffs file that they had on the missing person. Like all of the all the information they've gathered? Yeah. Uh, it was, it's, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of video recovered. There's a lot of documents, interviews. I did not review everything in there. I reviewed portions of it. Did they update you as the chief person from Pottawatomie County Investigations? We had several meetings um, that not just I, but other members from the Sheriff's Office attended along with Council's Police Department members. And did they update you as far as what they had, as far as their file? We shared information, yeah. I shared what we had gathered and what they shared what they had gathered. And they shared that they had lots of information about the 13th of February, correct? Yeah, there was lots of video and so forth, yes. Did they share with you that they had received three reports that she was seen on the 14th? If they did, I don't recall those. Discussing it with Sam about the tools, did he tell you that Justin Bramer sold those tools on uh, Facebook Marketplace for him? The who? Justin Bramer, his son, or Jason. Justin. Justin. I'm sorry, I can't read my name right. I don't recall that name being mentioned during our conversation. Okay. Nothing further. Any redirect? No, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. You are excused. Burger? And release from any subpoena. Can we post this? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take an early lunch today, which anybody in this courthouse will tell you is not Judge Davidson's policy. I'm usually a late, late judge or a late lunch guy, um, but we're going to take a early lunch just because it makes more sense in um, you're not interrupting witnesses. And then I anticipate um, it's going to be another early out for you today as well. But I want to assure you that we're on schedule and maybe even ahead of, of the schedule that these attorneys thought that they'd be on. So with that in mind, um, let's be back at 1230 and we'll try to be on the record as soon thereafter as possible. Um, as I've told you before, please uh, remember that admonition. Keep an open mind until you've heard all the evidence. Don't talk about this case amongst yourselves or anyone else. And thanks for not using your cell phones. We'll be in recess till 
anticipate two witnesses. Um, be prepared to visit with me this afternoon in chambers about instructions. Yes, sir. I worked on them last night, <clears throat> um, and I'll think I'm going to have something pretty good working order for uh, us to discuss. And then tomorrow, I think it makes sense if we try to to uh, submit this case by the end of day of the day, and have you argue in the morning or excuse me in the afternoon. I think that'll be challenging. I'm not saying we can't do it, Your Honor, but um, we've got. I love a challenge. <laughs> we've, got two, we've got two. I don't mind a challenge, but I don't want to be, be rushed with our witnesses. The two two big witnesses tomorrow are the two medical examiners. I understand that. And I know the um, defense doesn't think maybe cross-examination is going to last that long, but I have a feeling that I will have Dr. Cruz for an hour and a half or two hours on direct myself. Um, and I Dr. Was, Cruz? And, and I how was, long for bed? Uh, well, I don't. That's probably less for him, certainly. But I, mean, I would say even if I... I mean, a lot of the same type of questions I'm going to ask her, I'm going to ask him. So, hour. So, I probably have the morning's worth just Joe, off direct. <coughs> or Drew, whichever one you're going to be handling it. Um, I'm, not going to hold, I'm not going to hold you to any time frame, but um, and based, on, based on what Mr. Wilbers told me, any chance we can get this uh, wrapped up in the morning? Judge, I think a lot of that is dependent on Mr. Wilbur. Um, obviously, we've taken a deposition on Dr. Cruz. Um, I anticipate them asking a lot of questions that were asked of her in the deposition. I don't anticipate a ton of cross on her, um, and I don't anticipate Mr. Reedy having a ton of cross on Dr. Bodden either. All right. Well, just know your judge's mind, which is um, if there's some way without rushing any of the examination and rushing a, a luncheon break, I would like to have this this uh, jury hear argument, and then I may have them break for the evening and come back Friday morning to begin deliberations. But if they can have it by tomorrow evening, um, late afternoon, I think that's the best thing for them. But uh, if not, um, they'll be back bright and early Friday morning, and you'll argue, and then they'll have it lunchtime Friday. And is there any reason I shouldn't anticipate that? Well, I'm just saying it's, it's very challenging for us, Judge. You've seen my closing arguments. No, any really reason just, I shouldn't oh. be anticipating that it's going to be either tomorrow afternoon for argument or Friday at the latest, Friday oh, morning. Absolutely. Friday, I mean, we're going to be prepared to go. I, there's no way these two witnesses are going to last longer than the full day. This jury is going to have this case by either Thursday evening or Friday at noon. That's, I think that is accurate. All right. Um, why don't we plan on being in chambers at um, 12, 20? It won't take but a, a few minutes. I just want to make um, some of the record that I alluded to earlier. Sure. Thanks, Your Honor. We're in recess.
and I made it so the out and out is right up there. Uh, no, my main job right now is, uh, so I do UNO, Baxter Arena, uh -huh. Mecca, which is the CHI Arena as well. So those are only okay. two. But other than that, you, like, yeah, other than that, usually yeah. 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 yeah, there's some of those day games for tasks, but really, Fridays and Saturday nights are really worked out for me. Okay. Like, or they're really closed off because that's usually like UNO hockey. Oh, gotcha. Alright. Oh. Alright. That's all the family. Persons. If they have anything to give us, they can give it to you. If they have anything to give us, can you give it to us? If you're really concerned, I'm sure you'll have to give it to us. If you're really concerned, I'm sure you'll have to give it to us. If you're really concerned, I'm sure you'll have to give it to us. Tell us to give it to us. It's been sitting here. Sorry, I was just responding. No, you're good. No, you're fine. You're good. Uh, you're good. Yeah. 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 So, like, I was like, hey, where's the crew? I was like, you know, the phone numbers. Right. 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 Right.
I'm just kidding.
Please be seated, folks. We're back on the record after our lunch and recess. The state is continuing to call their witnesses. The state may call their next witness. Thank you, Judge. The state would call FBI Special Agent Nathan Halp. Thank you, Judge. Can you state your full and complete name and spell it, please? Yes. Uh, my first name is Nathan, spelled N-A-T-H-A-N. Last name is Halp, H-O-U-P-T. And where are you currently employed? I'm currently employed with the FBI. And how long have you been employed with the FBI? I've been with the FBI for almost 14 years now. Did you serve in any other law enforcement agencies prior to the FBI? I did. There were two. Uh, the first was the U.S. Secret Service Uniform Division. Uh, I was located in D.C. for that, and that was from 2004 to 2008. The second was the U.S. Postal Inspection Service as a postal inspector, and I was located in Baltimore for that, and that was from 2008 to 2010. What FBI office do you currently work out of? I'm currently assigned to the Omaha FBI field office, um, which covers both Iowa and Nebraska. Is there a particular unit or division within that FBI office? Yes, uh, there's two that I'm assigned to. The first is the Omaha Child Exploitation and Human Trafficking Task Force, and the second is the CAS team, which stands for Cellular Analysis Survey Team. What types of, what types of cases do you investigate? So on the task force, uh, we investigate violations involving human trafficking, uh, possession and production of child pornography, missing children and kidnappings. And on the CAST team, we analyze historical call detail records, cell site information, and other forms of geolocation data in furtherance of criminal investigations. What is CAST unit? So as I previously mentioned, CAST is an acronym uh, for the Cellular Analysis Survey Team. And we're a group of individuals in the FBI that have extensive training in radio frequency theory, cellular technology, and training from all the major cellular network providers. CAST will use this training in one of three ways. They'll use it to locate missing persons or subjects in a real-time perspective manner or through a historical analysis. We'll also use it to testify as experts in court like we're doing today. And the last thing we'll use it for is to teach other federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies through our CAS basic program. In the end, CAS was created around 2010 due to the growing number of cell phones in criminal cases. But the bread and butter of what CAS does is historical cell site analysis. Agent Alp, what is your education educational background? So I have a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice, and I got that from Marshall University in 2004. How long have you been part of the CAST? So I started with the CAST program back in 2018, but I didn't get certified until September of 2021. Since being certified, I pretty much do it full-time within our division, uh, which has been a, a little over two years now. Do you receive any training as a CAST agent? Yes, uh, I've received over 264 hours of in-person training uh, from both government entities and private contractors, and this has consisted of uh, training in areas involving radio frequency theory, uh, basic and advanced historical record analysis, basic and advanced cellular tracking using specialized equipment, uh, training from all the major cellular network providers, uh, mock trial training and expert witness training, as well as practical practical exercises. Did this training include any type of examination? It does. Throughout the process, we're required to take and complete a variety of 
handwritten and uh, practical exercises uh, to move on to the next stage. What about any continuing training or certifications? We do. On a yearly basis, the CAST team will meet in order to get recertified in their drive test equipment, as well as to meet with all the major cellular network providers to learn of, it, learn of any updates or changes to their networks. Do you have any instructional or teaching responsibilities in this area? I do. Because I'm part of the Omaha field office, uh, and we cover Iowa and Nebraska, and one of our core responsibilities is to teach other federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, um, I'm part of the... Uh, I'm one of the individuals that assist in putting on the CAS basic program, on it, and I've done so as of last October, and then the month before that I assisted in one in Kansas City, as well as back in, I believe it was June of 2019 down in Kansas City. My approach, Your Honor. You may. I'm handing you State's Exhibit 14A for identification purposes. Do you know what this is? Yes, that is my CV that I've provided. And what, you can, what is contained within your CV? Basically everything that I just covered. Judge, would you like to open on 14A? Any objection to 14A? No, Your Honor. 14A is received. <coughs> may sound like a simple question, but what is a cell phone? So in simple terms, a cell phone is a radio. And it's a radio that communicates with its environment using radio frequency. And while on, that cell phone is constantly communicating with its environment, collecting those radio frequencies that are given off by the towers nearby. And as it's doing so, it's placing them on the cell phone's neighbor list uh, that the cell phone will later use in order to choose which tower it will utilize for service. I'll talk more about how that, how that phone interacts with the neighbor list and sets up a little tower once we talk about what a tower is. While you're on that topic, what is a tower, cell tower? So these days, towers, also known as cell sites or base transceiver stations, uh, they, they take on all different shapes and sizes and are typically disguised to blend in with their environment. They can look like church steeples, flagpoles, or light poles. Uh, they can be mounted on the side of buildings or even water towers, but you'll also still see those uh, typical towers going down the freeway. But regardless of what they look like, as a general rule, each one of these towers is comprised of three equal 120 degree sectors to give the best possible 360 degrees of coverage. The network service providers then identify each one of these sectors as either one, two, or three, or alpha, beta, gamma. Then they assign a unique identifier to each one of these towers called a cell ID. And it's unique to the tower uh, for the entire network. No other tower has that number. These towers are then strategically placed all about the network geographically to give you coverage as you move about the network. That's strategically done. Then attached to each one of these towers are antennas that have a downward tilt and project the radio frequency away from the tower to give you coverage. Uh, the network service providers know this, so they have to strategically place another tower nearby that gives you overlapping coverage. Uh, so as you move about from one area to the next, you will have coverage uh, as needed. Envision your lawn sprinkler system, how those zones overlap with one another, and they do so in order to prevent uh, any dead spots in your lawn. The same concept applies with the way these towers are strategically placed. How does a cell phone engage with a cell tower? So, as I previously mentioned, the cell phone is a radio collecting those radio frequencies given off by the tower and it's placing them on the neighbor list. And the neighbor list is going through a process called racking and stacking those signals that it's collecting in order to establish which uh, signal has the strongest, cleanest, and the overall best signal based on network parameters at the time. <clears throat> so whenever you go to utilize your phone or it's being request, uh, services are being requested from the tower, it will reach out to that neighbor list, identify that tower, set up on that tower, send it, the information down to the core, and out to the rest of the network to wherever it needs to go. And whenever it does that, it creates a log or an event in the records 
that are maintained by the network service providers, which are the very records that we use in order to conduct our cell site analysis with. Envision <clears throat> sitting in this courtroom uh, in terms of how the cell phone works, and it's filled with lamps. Uh, and if you wanted to read a book, you would typically go to the lamp closest to you uh, unless there's a wall separating you and that lamp, and at which point you're going to move to the next lamp. Same concept applies on how these cell phones interact with the network and set up or choose the tower, which is typically the closest tower uh, to the phone with the best line of sight. Earlier you had mentioned that CAST specializes in historical cell site analysis. Um, what is historical cell site analysis? So, by law, network service providers are required to maintain records of all the devices on their networks. These records document all of the incoming and outgoing calls, data, and text messages associated with the devices. These records are what we use, which are essentially the billing records that they maintain for your device, in order to conduct our analysis with, to determine the approximate location of the device during a given period of time in the records. What kind of records do you look at? So there's two main types. The first is the historical call detail records, or what we like to call the CDRs. These are your billing records. They document all of the incoming and outgoing calls, data, and text messages associated with your device. In the end, the records contain a variety of pieces of information. Uh, but what I'm most concerned with is the who, the when, and the where. The who are the two numbers in contact with each other. The when is the date, the time, and the duration uh, of the event that occurred. And the where is the cell site and sector associated with that event. What are call detail records? Well, like I explained, I got a little ahead of you there. Uh, they're basically the billing records that I just explained what they were. They document all of your income and outgoing calls, data, and text messages. The second report, which I failed to mention initially, is the tower list. That is a second report that they maintain of all of those towers uh, that are on the cell phone's network. This, too, contains a variety of pieces of information. And what I'm most concerned with is the unique identifier, the cell ID associated with that particular uh, cell site, as well as its azimuth, or its antenna direction, and then the latitude and longitude associated with that particular location of the tower geographically. So when I take that report along with the historical call detail records and combine them by putting them into a mapping software program, I'm able to recreate the approximate location of the device during a given period of time in the records. What do you do with the records when you're doing your analysis? So typically the records will come from an investigator or a prosecutor and we will look at those along with the fact pattern of a case that they're giving to us. In other words, a set of details going on with their case. Uh, we will look at those records in terms of that time period and then recreate the approximate location of the device to let the investigators know uh, where that device is or what that device is doing during that period of time. Approximately how many times have you performed historical cell site analysis, and in what types of cases? So I don't have the exact number, uh, but because I've been doing it about two years now, uh, maybe a little bit more, I think a conservative number is about 150 times. It's probably way more than that. Uh, but we do them in all types of cases, uh, mainly criminal cases such as um, robbery, robberies, burglaries, assaults, homicides, but also missing children uh, and kidnappings. I've also done them in public corruption cases as well as domestic terrorism cases. What agencies <clears throat> can request um, CAS services? So really anybody can. The majority of our requests come from uh, local, law, local, state, and federal law enforcement, but also prosecutors. Uh, but we've also had requests come from defense attorneys as well. Uh, the CAS team has uh, exonerated nearly a dozen people over the course of its tenure, and we've testified on behalf of the defense about a half a dozen times. At the end of the day, CAS are neutral parties. We're fact finders. We're interested in the truth, and we're here to tell you what's going on with the records.
Have you testified as an export as an expert in court before? I have, yes. And how many occasions have you done that? In which courts? Uh, this will be my twelfth time, and I've done it in both federal and state local courts. My approach, Judge. You may. Handing you States Exhibit 6, which has been entered into evidence. Um, can you read that number right there? Yes, that number is area code 712-314-1583. And what are, what's the provider in this, with these records? The provider is T-Mobile. And <clears throat> were you requested to analyze these records? I was, yes. Handing you States Exhibit 6A, which has been entered into evidence. Can you please read that number? Yes, so that number is area code 402 812 1247, and the provider for that one is also T Mobile. And were you asked to analyze these records as well? I was. Did you prepare a PowerPoint presentation in, in anticipation of this trial? I did, yes. May I approach, Judge? You may. I'm handing you which, uh, exhibit, the state's exhibit marked as Exhibit 15. Do you recognize that? I do, yes. This is the analysis I prepared for the case. Okay. Um, If you reference this PowerPoint presentation contained in this exhibit here, which is 15, would that help you in explaining uh, your analysis to the jury? It would, yes. Judge, I'd like to offer exhibit 15 at this time. Any objection to 15? Judge, I have no objection for demonstrative, but I don't think that the report without the explanation accompanying should be sent back to the jury, so I would not have an objection if it's for demonstrative purposes only. Let's take that in two pieces. First of all, let's make a uh, hear from both of you concerning whether this is going to be something demonstrative or not that goes back to the to the jury. Was it the uh, state's intent that if uh, the, if I accept and receive this exhibit, would it go back to the jury? Yeah, we think the jury should be allowed to read it. Um, be under Rule Five Point One Zero Zero Six. Summaries to prove, or sorry, uh, the proponent may use a summary chart or calculations to prove the, the content of voluminous writings, recordings, and photographs. This is vol obviously voluminous, Judge, if we, as we showed Exhibit 6 and 6A. I misunderstood you. To I thought you were talking about Exhibit 15 being a PowerPoint or video. It is the report, Judge. I would be publishing the report, and we've offered the report, which has been received in evidence. Let me reserve ruling on the current objection, and I'd like a little further foundation as to the report, how it was put together, and what it contains, and then I'll make a ruling as to how it's received. Now, is 15 received in evidence? I understand that it is. At this point, it's not. I want a little more further foundation. Just, of, just, just I the, I, he didn't. He simply said for demonstrative purposes, and I want to know how I'm going to receive it. Okay. Agent Hal, how I'm handing you Exhibit 15, and you've stated that you're familiar with this report, correct? Correct. And what what is this report? So this is an analysis of. <clears throat> the two records that I spoke about, which are the historical call detail records and the tower list, which are combined together, placed into the mapping software, 
and was given a fact pattern of the case for a time period that we're looking to analyze, which was February 13th and 14th, I believe, of 2023. This is a report of what the cellular devices are doing, meaning with the cell sites or the towers, for that given period of time. It's a recreation of the approximate location of those devices for this period of time. Are you, without a PowerPoint of this presentation that you put together, the report, are you able to conveniently convey to the jury your analysis with just Exhibit 6 and 6A? No. They would... The, the analysis is, or the report, is a visual of what the records are doing. Without that, I would just sit here and talk about what's going on, and you wouldn't understand the locations associated with it without a map associated. So, Judge, I'd like to re-offer Exhibit 15. That was your last question that answered any question that this judge may have. He's talking about uh, Exhibit 15 being a report that analyzes six and 6A, two exhibits that have already been received. Am I correct? Yes. That's just what he answered. Yes. But he, that was not part of any initial foundation. Um, any objection? No, Your Honor. Uh, exhibit 15 is received. You may. You may. Agent Halp, what does this exhibit depict? So this is the cover slide of the analysis, and it simply tells you who we are, the FBI cellular, cellular analysis team, who conducted the analysis, which is myself, uh, our internal case number, and then the two records analyzed. Uh, the first one is uh, the one we already talked about, area code 402-812-1247, belonging to T-Mobile. It's in black. The second one is 712-314-1583, also belonging to T-Mobile, which is in green. Those numbers will stay, uh, those colors, excuse me, will stay consistent throughout the course of the analysis for ease of viewing and understanding. Can you just tell me when you'd like to advance through? Yes, you can go ahead. Second slide is an introduction. We've covered a lot of this already. Uh, number one is the background on the case, what we were asked to do. We were kind of contacted by Council Boss Police Department in reference to a missing person case uh, and asked to conduct an analysis uh, of the records that were acquired for these two particular target numbers to determine the pattern of life uh, on February 13th um, and part of 14th as well of 2023. Number two is the methodology. I talked about this already. It's where we take those records that are maintained uh, by the network service providers that contain all those incoming and outgoing calls, data, and text messages. And we combine them with 2.1, which is the cell site locations, uh, by importing them into a mapping software and confirming the connections with what we see in the records uh, to determine the approximate location, uh, number three, of a given device or a device during a given period of time in the records. You can go. This slide, I like to put that in there just to give you a visual representation of what towers look like uh, in, your, in the environment. Um, in this particular case, the four towers on the far left-hand side, which is the monopole, the lattice, structural, and the guide wire, uh, are the four towers that, you're, that we have in this case. So we don't have any that look like cactuses or flagpoles or anything like that, but it just gives you a visual rep representation of how they disguise those to blend in with your environment.
Page four is a sector's orientation um, and illustration of basically a bird's eye view of what a tower looks like from above and how those sectors are, are divided into three equal 120 degree sectors to give it the best possible 360 degrees of coverage. On the left hand side there, you can see those arrows in the middle of each one of those sectors, which is the azimuth or the uh, center portion of that tower where there are 60 degrees on each side of it to give you the full 120. That's good. Excuse me. That's going to be expressed in uh, degrees, sort of like a compass direction to give you the direction of which that sector is facing. On the right hand side of it is a very similar illustration, but it, you see the the red arcs or the red wedge that's associated with it. And that's what you're going to see populated in the mapping software and how that associates with a particular sector uh, during the activation of a given event in the records. <clears throat> Page five is a mapping illustration. On the left hand side of it, you see that three sector illustration uh, at the very top there, which is basically what you saw on the previous slide. That's how it's going to look on the map. And those are the active sectors displayed as a wedge with a shaded arc. Now that shaded arc does not give you a distance. That's only shaded to let you know what direction the radio frequency is moving away from the tower or which cell sector is activated. Those symbols are <clears throat> not intended to be a minimum or maximum distance, uh, but they will illustrate the sector selected by the target cell phone at the times listed and will illustrate the general area uh, that the target cell phone was located during that period of time. On the right hand side is an event box illustration. That event box is going to be associated with that activation that you see on the left hand side. When we get to the mapping portion of it, and it's going to contain all the details of what's going on in the records to let you know what that activation involves. If we go through one through seven real quick, number one is going to be your cell ID number. That's that unique tower number assigned by the service provider to the tower and sector associated with the event. Number two is going to be your date. That's the date the activation occurred in the records that's being mapped. Three is the target number being mapped, that meaning those set of records that were set up here, uh, the target number associated or the first one is going to be your target number listed in those um, records. Four is going to be the local time. In this case, it will be central time. Uh, but I put there beside there UTC minus six from November uh, 6th of 2022 uh, to March 12th, March 12th of 2023. Uh, that's central standard time. Um, the records come in UTC time, which is universal time coordinated. And it's a standard form of time that the world can adjust their clocks to. It's zero degrees longitude, uh, or the prime meridian. And as you move west from it, as you enter each time zone, you subtract one hour from that uh, to put it in the correct time zone. Number five is the event type. Uh, in this case, for voice, it's going to be incoming or outgoing. Number six is going to be your duration. Again, that's uh, the duration in seconds for a voice call. And seven is going to be a number associated with entry or the non-target number that the target number is in contact with in the records. And in other words, when I mention the who, the when, and the where in the records, the two numbers in contact with each other, this is the associate number uh, that the target number is in contact with. And then I put a small little box down there to read uh, what that box says, and basically it says the target number uh, ending in 1875, place an outgoing call to uh, associate number ending in 7940 at 1024 p.m. on May 12th of 2021 that lasted for 287 seconds. That's just an example, though. That's not. That's an example. These are not the target numbers associated with it, but you will see the uh, the green uh, cell site uh, activation in this particular analysis. All right. This is a separate report. This is the time in advance explanation and illustration. 
Now, not in all cases, but in some cases, uh, this is a separate report that we can get from the network service providers, providing we get it in enough time because it's perishable data. And with T-Mobile, after 30 days, it's no longer in existence and we can't obtain it. In this case, we were able to. Basically, what time in advance is, is a uh, round trip measurement from the tower to the phone and then the phone sending the signal back to the tower, which provides a measurement uh, for the network and gives you the maximum distance that the phone can be from the tower. Time in advance for uh, T-Mobile is called True Call, and it's a necessary protocol in the network that essentially tells the phone when to set up on the network. Without it, the phones couldn't operate. So it <clears throat> it's basically like uh, the way your zipper works. Pretend that the your cell phone or the, the prongs to the zipper and the zipper itself is the tower. As you move the zipper up to close your jacket, those teeth perfectly align with one another, another to close up the zipper. If one is off, then there's a clog or a jam. The same concept applies with this engineering report that we're able to get. Uh, it gives the phone the appropriate time slot on the network so it can work seamlessly and give you services as necessary. In my opinion, it's some of the best uh, data that you can get because it's independent of the call detail records. It just needs to be on <clears throat> because it's collecting those measurements from all the towers in its area and it's placing them on this report, which gives you the distance away from the tower. On the left-hand side, you can see a, a quick illustration of what that looks like. Again, you get the cell site activated with that uh, arc away from it. That arc is going to illustrate the time in advance, and typically we will find the phone uh, within that uh, arc, but we've also found it closer before. <clears throat> and on the right-hand side, um, it goes into further explanation and basically states that the neighboring towers do not have any impact on the estimated location of the mobile device. And that's basically the way it's going to look like uh, in the analysis on each of the maps. Page 7. I like to give a geographic overview of what the network looks like and the geographic area that we're going to be analyzing. <clears throat> What you see there, the green dots, are all the towers associated with the T-Bubble network. Uh, during the December 2022 and April 2023 time period, as you can see, being close to the downtown areas, there's a greater concentration of, what those, of those towers in that area versus when you get to the outskirts of town or the rural areas, they get further apart. That's by design. They do that intentionally because of popula population density or landforms. Uh, so as you get further outside of that, they need less resources to accommodate that. On the left-hand side of the screen, you see a legend. And there's a variety of icons in there that identify, uh, looks like crime scene, Ivan Bremer's residence, a relevant location, the Sherwood Forest Apartments a pickup location, and then Eileen Gowan's uh, temporary residence. All of those icons will remain the same color associated with each one of those locations throughout the course of the analysis, again, for ease of viewing and understanding. And then they're mapped on uh, the map are the locations of each one of those. So you can get, in, get an idea of the proximity uh, of the locations to one another. The bottom right-hand corner just shows a blow-up version of what Council Bluffs looks like and a couple of those relevant locations that are identified in the legend. Okay, uh, getting into the analysis now. Again, those target numbers that we've already talked about are going to stay consistent in color, and I'm going to refer to them by the last four digits just for uh, ease of understanding and um, speed. Your Honor. I'm going to object at this point to narrative. I haven't heard a question in a couple of minutes. Overruled. He's describing the, the analysis for a summary purpose. Um, however, Mr. Forney would do it. I can ask you yes. um, Give us some other direction so sure, it's not course. just a road narrative. Uh, Agent Halp, what does this slide indicate? 
So page eight is going to be an analysis of both of our target devices, uh, the one in green ending in 1583 and the one in red, I'm sorry, excuse me, not red, and black ending in 1247. And it's going to, going to be for the time period of February 13th of 2023 from 7.15 a.m. to 8.15 a.m. Then you see a small little box off to the side or a small little uh, disclaimer that says not all time in advance uh, for the phone number ending in 1583 is shown during the time, time frame. And I'll explain that uh, here in one second. Actually, there was none for that particular number, and I'll, I'll talk more about that when I talk about what's in the call-out boxes. But basically what it's detailing here is uh, target number ending in 1247 is in the area of 800 North 34th Street. And the second target number ending in 1583 is in the area of 2725 East Canesville Boulevard. You can see that depiction on the far left-hand side uh, for our target number ending in uh, 1247. How there's a number of cell site activations on towers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, uh, which is the time in advance measurements associated with that particular device. And then on box 3, uh, you see, excuse me, let me back up one just before I get to box 3. Um, and each one of those time in advance boxes, it's going to be 1, 2, 4 and 5, you see a TA equals and then a measurement. That's going to be the distance of those time and advance measurements from the tower. In box 3, you're going to see the call activity associated with the particular device, uh, which happens to be on tower 3 there, and you can't really see that. We will in the next slide because I have a blown up slide of it. But that's going to be a very small cell site associated with T-Mobile. They call it a FEMTO site, an F-E-M-T-O. It's a very small cell site that is typically placed inside of a residence or a small business, or in this case an apartment complex to provide service. Um, so you would have to be very close to that particular cell site in order to use it. In this case, all of the calls for that target device ending in 1247 utilize that particular cell site for service uh, and those calls that he made, or that the target number made, um, you can see in the highlights there, were to the second target number of 1583. And then those calls correspond to what you see in box 6 in the cell site activation over there by the Shortwood Forest Departments. There are a number of calls uh, from 7.15 to 8.07 a.m., three of which that are highlighted are in communication with the other target number. So that's what I did for this. Any type of calls that you see that are highlighted uh, are the two target numbers in contact with each other. So what would be the range of a, did you say FEMTO? The FEMTO site, yes. FEMTO. Okay. What would be the range of a FEMTO site? It'd be very small. It would be like a house or a small business. Uh, maybe even a small apartment complex. It wouldn't be very far. So would the the target number 402-812-1247 be connected in this slide to the FEMTO site? Yes, it's in communication with that particular FEMTO site, as you can see there, uh, and the, the call-out box 3, as well as um, the number associated with the tower number 3. You'll see that better on the next slide when it's blown up. Uh, but that is the Femto site right there. And is that also close to the blue box that says Ivan Bramer's residence? Yes, it's in the general area of that residence. And then up, up top, you've basically given a time range on February 13th, 2023, correct? That's correct. And that time range is between 7.15 a.m. and 8.15 a.m.? Correct. Okay. What does this slide depict? So page 9 is what I just briefly mentioned a second ago. It's a blown-up slide of the previous one to illustrate to you uh, the location of that FEMTO site that's in the area of uh, Bremer's residence. Uh, it just shows you uh, all the arcs that are overlapping it uh, from the, the area towers and how that uh, cell phone is util utilizing that tower. What does this slide depict? 
<clears throat> so it's a continuation of the timeline from the previous slide. Again, with our two target numbers. Uh, these are going to be the cell site connections, again on the 13th of 2023 from 8.15 a.m. to 8.31 a.m. And you're going to see how the target device ending in 1247 uh, moves from the area of the residence identified as Ivan Bremer's and travels sort of in a easterly and then a northeasterly direction towards the residence of uh, the Shore, Shorewood, uh, Shorewood Apartments. Uh, not all timing advanced measurements are shown during this, this for ease of viewing. If I were to put all of them up there, it would be like a Picasso painting. You wouldn't be able to see what's going on because the measurements would be all over the place. So I showed the initial one, and I showed the ending one, which is why you only see two of the arcs. But I did show the cell site activations to show the travel. Now, I don't know the exact route of travel. I just know it's in that direction. And you can see from uh, the time range analyzed, which is about 16 minutes, it takes either that or just under that to travel that distance from uh, Ivan Bremer's residence over to the Shortwood Apartments. <clears throat> Once there, you see cell site activations on Tower 3 with the call-out Box 3, and you only see calls for both of these devices during that time period. There's no time in advance associated with them. <clears throat> so we only had incoming and outgoing calls, and those calls are between the two numbers, and they are co-located on the same tower at about the same time. And which tower would that be? It's the tower identified as number three, along with its call-out box, number three. So both cell phones, um, the defendant Ivan Brammer's phone and Eileen Gowan's phone are connecting to tower three. That's correct. And the defendant's phone is traveling, started at his residence, is traveling... East, correct? Correct. It goes east and quarter, then sort of like a northeasterly direction to the same tower and sector that the second target phone is using. What does this slide depict? So again, a continuation of the timeline for both of our target phones. This one is from 8.31 a.m. to 8.52 a.m., again on February 13th of 23. Not all of our time in advance measurements are, are going to be illustrated here, again, for ease of viewing. But you can see where those cell phones start out. Again, they ended on the previous slide over by the Sherwood Apartments. They're starting there on this particular slide. And we start with Tower 1 with those phone calls that you saw on the previous slide. Then you can see the phones moving back towards the area identified as the relevant location. Uh, which is where you see time and advance measurements for both devices in that same general geographic area at the same time. So, our, at, so we're looking at 8.31 a.m. to 8.52 a.m., correct? That's correct. And these phones at this, on this slide, are they traveling together? Uh, it would appear so, yes. So you can see on Tower 2 or the one identified as Tower 2 along with its call-out box, that both, both devices have a time and advance measurement on that uh, roughly at the same time. And then shortly thereafter, both phones are communicating with the same towers identified as 3, 4, and 5, as you can see from the call-out boxes. And the phones are traveling west now, correct? Uh, southwest and then west. What does this slide depict? Okay, slide 12, again, both of our target numbers that we've identified, same color. Continuation of the timeline, previous slide ended at 8.52. This one starts at 8.52 on February 13th of 2023. <clears throat> and the ending time for this one is at 9.16 a.m. And what this shows is where the phones were previously ending on the other slide, on the last slide, which is at that relevant location, traveling back to where the Sherwood uh, Forest Apartments are. 
And you can see that from the last line in the header up there. Device is traveling from the area of Avenue B and North 25th Street to the area of 2009 Sherwood Court. And you can see that based on the time and advance measurements of uh, 1 and 2, uh, or towers 1 and 2, along with their associated tower tags. And then ending over here uh, on 3 and 4, uh, which is uh, where both devices have time and advance measurements near the Sherwood Forest Apartments. And does it, uh, again, appear that both phones are traveling together? It does appear that. What's this side depict? So slide 13. Um, the previous slide ended at 916. This one's going to also be with both of our target devices we've been discussing. Uh, starting on 9.16 a.m. to 9.41 a.m. on February 13th of 23. Again, not all time and advance measurements shown. It's showing the phones starting out in the location that we last left off in the area of the Sherwood Forest Apartments and then traveling to the area of Levi Carter Park, Nebraska. And again, I don't know the exact route of travel, uh, but the time uh, analyzed here would be a, the approximate time that it would take to travel over to that area of Levi Park, uh, Levi Carter Park, Nebraska, where you can see those ending time and events measurements identified on towers three and four, where both phones are located. So would it be accurate to say that both phones are together, first moving west, and then both phones are also still together moving north across the river um, on the Nebraska side. That's correct. You can see a variety of cell site activations without the time in advance measurements uh, and both colors there, uh, which identifies each one of the devices separately, uh, moving in roughly the same direction and then ending in the same area. What does this slide depict? So our last slide ended with both numbers arriving in the area of Levi Carter Park, Nebraska. This one shows the duration in which those phones remained in that geographic area, which was approximately 9.41 a.m. to 10.17 a.m. on February 13th of 23. And again, it just shows uh, the devices remaining in that area for a period of time uh, based on all the time and advance measurements that you can see here. It is. It's, it's actually Carter Lake if you cross over Carter Lake and get into Iowa. Uh, but because uh, I believe those, those phones traveled across the river and went north, Levi Carter Park would be on the Nebraska side, where if you were to be on the Iowa side, it would be Carter Lake. And both phones are together? C correct. As you can see from the number of time and advance measurements, on all the towers that are activated there, you can see the color change between the two and the measurements associated with them. And the ending time on this slide is 10.17 Correct. What does this slide say? All right, 15's got a lot going on with it because there's a lot of time and events that's associated with this. Uh, and there's a lot of movement going on with towers that service both locations, which makes it a little bit more confusing. But to walk through it, we're continuing with the previous timeline, starting at 10.17 a.m. with both devices, uh, the one in green ending in 1583, the one in black ending in 1247. Our start time for this is 10.17 a.m. and the ending is at 10.41 a.m. on February 13th of 23. Again, not all time and advance measurements shown, just the cell site activations to give you the direction of travel. And it shows the devices traveling from the area of Levi Carter Park, Nebraska, to the area of 800 North 34th Street, which is uh, Ivan Bremer's residence. If you look over there to the basically the top left-hand corner of the analysis where those phones are in the area of Levi Carter Park, you can see them depart in a south southerly direction and then come easterly across the river and then eventually move north towards the ending location which is the uh, apartment complex belonging to Ivan uh, Bremer. Would it be fair to say that the, the phones are traveling together and they actually 
actually had, they had traveled back into Council Bluffs at that time when they were at least temporary one of them. Yes, so they're co-located in the area of Levi Carter Park based on what you see there on the time and events measurements. And then they are also co-located together uh, uh, in the area of Ivan Bremer's residence um, during the ending portion of this time period, which is at 1041. So moving on with the timeline from the previous slide, previous slide ended at 10.41 a.m. This one starts at 10.41 a.m. And it shows the duration that both devices are in the general geographic area of Ivan Bremer's residence, uh, which is approximately five minutes. It's 10.41 a.m. to 10.46 a.m. And both devices are in the same general geographic area. Once again, co-located, uh, as you can see from the number of time and advance measurements on a variety of towers that are associated with those devices. So I think we jumped two minutes from the previous slide on timeline just because of travel and be difficult to track. But you can see where those phones, uh, well, just the target number uh, ending in 1247 uh, moved from the area of Ivan Bremer's residence to the area of that relevant location, uh, which happens to be Avenue B uh, and North 25th Street there in Council Bluffs. And it's in that area for approximately man, two minutes or so. And you, I don't see anything for That's correct. I put a caveat up there in the header where it said there were no cell site activations for uh, that number ending in 1583 during time frame. And that means there was nothing in the call detail records or in the time in advance records uh, to be able to map. Does that happen sometimes? It does. Okay, so the last slide, uh, this is continuation of the timeline uh, from the previous slide. Uh, we're moving back to both devices during this. Um, the, the target number ending in 1583, as well as 1247 um, on February 13th of 23 from 1050 a.m. to 1056 p.m. Again, not showing all the time in advance measurements, but we are... Uh, I am illustrating the towers as well as uh, some of the measurements for each device to show that the phones are moving in the same general uh, direction, uh, which happens to be from the relevant location identified there in blue with the eye in the middle um, towards the Shorewood Apartments. So on this slide, would it be fair to say that the defendant's phone and Eileen's phone are together between 1050 and 1056, and they're traveling, both traveling east, then heading northeast. They're in the same general geographic area, that's correct. Okay. Uh, be before you jump to that one, there's a caveat at the top of that slide. Oh, yes, please. <clears throat> so what you see illustrated is what's identified in the header, uh, 1050 to 1056 a.m., and then if you take a look in those two little black boxes at the top right-hand corner, I have a couple caveats up there. Uh, the first one is for our target number ending in 1247. And it says there are no mappable cell site connections for that target number from February 13th of 23 between the hours of 1056, 20 a.m. and 1234 and 55 uh, p.m. Sorry, there's a glare there. What that means is uh, there's no cell site activity uh, in the records. There are records, which means there's an SMS message uh, that you can see in the records, but SMS C messages or text messages with T-Mobile do not have cell site information associated with it. So when you see the phone not communicating with the network like that, similar to what you see with the second target phone there ending in uh, 1583. I have a caveat there that there are no cell site uh, connections for that target number from February 13th of 23. At about the same time, uh, for that one, it's at 1054 and 26 a.m. 
to 12.35 and 12 p.m. There's no text messages in that particular uh, record at all. So there's no activity whatsoever. Sometimes when we see that, it can mean a variety of different things, and I don't know exactly what it means because uh, the records don't tell you. But it could mean that the phone uh, is turned off, could be in airplane mode, or in some form or fashion not communicating with the network. Now, in knowing that and looking at that first caveat for the target number ending in 1247, if the phone would be off or in airplane mode or whatever, not communicating with the network during that time period, because there's a text message, it would have to come back on at some point in order to receive that because it was a visual voicemail, visual voicemail notification. So I don't have all the details of the powering on and powering off events associated with the device because the records don't always detail that, and I don't know the significance of it. The best um, source of information for that would be the forensic download of the phone. So just so that I understand you correctly, both phones at some point in time it looks like it's around 10.56 for the defendant's phone and around 10.54 for Eileen's phone are not communicating with the network. Is that a fair statement? Yes. And when you say not communicating with the network, then it could be maybe one of three things. You said it could just be manually shut off. It could be airplane mode. But is it, do you know if it was, could, could it be airplane mode in this scenario? It could be. It's just not okay. communicating with the cell network. Um, there's no indications in the records that would tell me uh, which one of those would occur. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the phones are just not communicating with the network. There's no cell site information populated for us to map to illustrate where that would be. And in the records, with the exception of the first one identified as 1247, there's no other activity. The one with 1247 at around 1117 a.m. has a visual voicemail that is received. It's a text message. You can see it in the record. So there is some activity. The, the phone does receive it. Um, so if in the event that the phones are powered off, um, they would, it would have to be powered on in order to receive that information. But if the phones were off, there would be no information. Is that correct? Uh, Correct. Now, then you have, from this slide, it appears that the defendant's phone comes on at 12.34, and Eileen's phone comes on at 12.35. Is that correct? That's correct. And... Anything else about this slide? No, it just shows both of the phones uh, after it's traveling roughly in the same direction uh, that they no longer communicate with the network around the same time and then later come back on or there's cell site data in the records around the same time. What does this slide depict? So based on what we just discussed, you saw the ending times of those uh, cell site activations. Um, or there being no cell site activations to be around 12.34, 12.35. This is the start time for where those phones begin communicating with the cellular network again. And you can see both phones, um, the one ending in 1583 and the, one, uh, the second one ending in 1247, on February 13th of 23, beginning at 12.34 p.m. Uh, to 1 o'clock p.m., uh, in the general area of trainer, now I don't know exactly where there because it's a very vast area and there's a number of um, time and advance measurements, but it's for both devices uh, in the same general geographic area uh, when they begin communicating with the network again. And then they travel west uh, towards the Omaha area and then eventually travel north back to the area of where uh, Ivan, Bremer, Ivan Bremer's residence is located. And you can confirm that with the number of cell site activations there uh, and the tower tags associated with both devices uh, on how they're co-located when they come back on the network 
and then once again uh, at the ending location for that time period around one o'clock. So if this is accurate, so both phones, both Eileen's phone and the defendant's phone come on at 1234 off of the tower out in Trainer. Correct? Uh, I wouldn't say come on. They began communicating with the network. So again. they start communicating again with the network. Yes, I, I can't determine whether they're sure. off or what, whatever sure. it might be. It's just there's cell site activity that begins populating the records with the events in that area. But do you have any doubt whether the phones are together or not? Uh, it would appear that the phones are co-located when they do come back, uh, begin communicating with the network again over in Trainerd area. Because both phones are now communicating with the network at 12, around 1234. Uh, yes, and they're on the same tower and in some instances the same sector. And they would be traveling together back west and then north up around where Ivan Brammer's residence is, correct? Correct. That would and, be the ending location. And are both phones at that time connecting to a network? Uh, yes. They're all, it's connected to the network uh, beginning at 1234, and as it moves west uh, and north back in the area of uh, Brammer's residence, where once again they are co-located in that general geographic area. And the end time? is 1 p.m. connecting, both connecting in the, at the tower near defendant's residence. Correct. Could you please uh, tell me what's going on in this slide? <laughs> yes, so uh, same two target numbers, same date, February 13th of 23, continuation of the timeline from the previous slide. Here we're beginning at 1 o'clock p.m., and we're ending at 1.13 p.m. Uh, you can see the duration in which those cell phones were in the general geographic area uh, based on the number of cell site activations uh, or timed advance measurements associated with both devices, which place the phones in the same geographic area um, as one another, or they're co-located, and they're co-located in the area of where Ivan Bremer's residence is, or in the <coughs> general geographic area where the residence is. You've got an annotation up top in black. Yes. So <clears throat> the first one there is okay. So I have the that's okay. I have it. Uh, I have the caveat the same for both of them. There are no mappable cell site connections for either device uh, for that. <laughs> for the time period that's listed in those boxes. We'll start with the first one, which is the number ending in 1583. Um, there are no mappable cell site activations, meaning no towers listed with any events in the records, even though that there are text messages in the records during this time period. And I'll talk about those in one second after I discuss what the time period is here. Uh, on February 13th of 23, from 1.13 p.m. to February 14th, of 23 at 6.53 a.m. The second device also has no mappable uh, cell site information uh, during that time period, the second device being 1247. On February 13th of 23, between the hours of 1.13 p.m. until 3... Uh, 3.21 p.m. Now, the way I worded that gives me an indication, based on what, after looking at the records, that there are text communications in the records. In other words, there, it, it's just not dead spot in the records. There's communication between two, between those target numbers and text back and forth between one another. There's just no cell site information associated with it. <clears throat> so I'm unable to determine the exact location of the device. Now... Um, but it does illustrate that the, uh, there is activity on the devices. So the phones are together at Brammer's residence at 1 o'clock. And then at 1.13, Eileen's phone is not connect connecting with the network anymore, correct? And it's not, it's not, you said it's not mappable. 
Well, it's there's no cell site activations in the records. Okay. No, okay, no, no cell site activations. Right, there's no cells. tower information associated with the text messages that are in the records during that time period because the SMS C messages, the text, that particular version of text message with T-Mobile does not carry cell site information with it. Okay, and is, is that another example where a bit where it would have been one of the three? It's either manually shut off, it's airplane mode, or what? It could have been. Uh, those are the possibilities, um, but it also could be connected to Wi-Fi as well, uh, which would not produce any cell site information if there were a phone call or any time in advance. It may not produce any time in advance that goes with it as well. But regardless, you still have all those text communication between the two, vi two devices uh, for the time period, uh, so there's likely going to have to be, uh, the, the phones are going to have to be on at some point if they're not on the whole time. What does this slide indicate? Okay, so this is... <clears throat> Again, involving both of our target numbers, 1583 and 1247, this is going to be the cell site activity um, for both devices the following day, which is February 14th of 23, from 7.55 p.m. to 8.20 p.m. And again, not all time in advance is shown uh, for the number ending in 1247 during time frame. Uh, and there's no time in advance. In other words, there's none in the records for the target number ending in 1583 during time frame. You can see from the analysis that the target number ending in 1247 um, originally is in the general geographic area of Ivan Bremer's residence, uh, which is 800 North 34th Street, and then travels uh, in an easterly and then a northeasterly direction uh, towards 2725 East Canesville Boulevard uh, or the Shorewood Forest Apartments, whichever one of those icons you want to use, um, where you have both devices communicating with the same tower at roughly the same time, which is identified on number four there, tower, tower number four with tower tag associated with it. You can see on that particular tower, target number that's in green ending in 1583 checks a voicemail for 109 seconds and then target the second target number uh, ending in 1247 receives an incoming call for 530 seconds uh, during that time period as well and they're both communicating with not only the same tower but the same sector uh, which co-locates them in the same general geographic area at roughly the same time. And that was, was that, number, that was number four, correct? That was tower identified with number four and, and its associated tower tag. So the target number ending in 1583 in green is at 8.15 p.m. The second target number ending in 1247 uh, is at 8.19 p.m. So on February 14, 2023, at 8.15 p.m., Eileen's phone is connected to, to tower number 44, and at 8.19 p.m., the defendant's phone is Correct. You don't have time advance on that one? Uh, not for that particular 
uh, cell site activation on number four. No, there's no time in advance associated with the target number ending in 1583 during that time period. Um, and there wasn't any four uh, on that particular tower identified as number four. There was not any four one two four seven. Although just before that time period, at eight, excuse me, just after that time period at eight twenty p.m., you can see on number the tower identified as number five. There, there's a time in advance measurement. Uh, and cell site activation for target number ending in 12474 for uh, that time period. Now, after after 8.15 p.m. with Eileen's phone was connected to Tower 4, did you ever have any other, did you ever see any other data connecting with the Tower for Eileen's phone after that? So after that 8.15.38 p.m., and this is what's up in the black box there, um, the target number ending in 1583 uh, does not have any other cell site activations in the records for the remaining time period, which ends on February 23rd of 23 at 12.44 p.m., which is the end of her records. <clears throat> and all calls during that time period are incoming, and they rolled a voicemail. Um, also during that time period, the two target numbers in question in this analysis only communicate with each other twice. There's an incoming call to uh, Eileen's phone uh, from target number ending in 1247, and then there's an incoming text message uh, also from that um, second target phone ending in 1247. Prior to February 14th, the duration of our records for this particular analysis is pretty much the month of February, February 1st to February uh, 23rd there. Prior to February 14th, the, there were approximately or just under 200 events between the two target numbers up to the 14th. After the 14th, which is what you see here down at the bottom on number four, after that time period until the end of the records, which is February 23rd of 23, there's two, and they're, they're both incoming from target number 1247. No further questions, Judge. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a uh, afternoon recess at this point. We'll be in recess for approximately 15 minutes. Please remember that admonition. Don't talk about this case. Keep an open mind, and thank you for not using your cell phones. We'll be in recess for 15 minutes. See you, folks. We're in recess.
want the summary up. Uh, Mr. Forney, I asked since I am Mr. Brown's copy, if we could drive from here to the library. Okay. I'll leave it up. We ready for a jury? We're ready? Please be seated. We're back on the record after our afternoon recess, and Special Agent Hout has retaken the stand. And mind you, sir, he's still under oath. Um, right before we took our recess, Mr. Forney, I understood that you were, had completed your direct examination. That's correct, Judge. Cross? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Good afternoon, Agent Hout. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, just want to go through a few things briefly. So you stated on direct that you had 264 hours of CAST training in your uh, background. I do. Uh, so that's roughly six and a half weeks at 40 hours a week. It's broken up into a variety of different classes. Uh, the last two iterations are two weeks apiece, which is the certification. The first couple iterations are three and four day classes. But in total... 40 hours a week would be about six and a half? Yes. Okay. Uh, you stated that CAST uh, has exonerated six people in its entire program. Is that correct? Uh, it's not an exact number. It's roughly. Is that the Omaha the office that fields both Iowa and Nebraska, or is that in the entire nation? That's in the entire program. Which is how big? The continental United States, nationwide. So out of... 330 million, I'm not saying there's 330 million criminal cases, but out of all those people, CAST has helped exonerate six of them, roughly. Roughly. Uh, you were contacted by the Council Plus Police Department to give your analysis and opinion on this case, is that correct? That's correct. And the two target numbers you gave or were given were belonged to Eileen Gowan and uh, Ivan Sam Brammer? That's correct. Did you receive any other uh, target numbers from the Council Plus Police Department? I did not. You did not receive any target number associated with Michael Brockman? No. Mr. Forney, if you wouldn't mind going to page 7. So this is, as you stated earlier, all of the cell towers in the Council Bluffs Omaha area. Is that correct? For the T-Mobile network. Okay, I apologize. For the T-Mobile network. Um, and then you said you notated that CS is the uh, crime scene. What, what do you mean by crime scene up in the uh, area by Crescent? Uh, that was the location that was provided uh, where Eileen was eventually found. Okay. So you have no other inclination to call that the crime scene other than the fact that her body was found there. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Forney, would you mind going to page 14?
Special Agent, you also stated on direct examination that between the times of 9.41 a.m. and 10.17 a.m. on February 14th, or 13th, excuse me, that both phones were co-located in the general area of Levi Carter Park? That's correct. Uh, I see your shaded arcs for bo box number one. Um, that also encompasses some of 70, Highway 75 in Omaha, is that correct? Maybe encompass Hi Highway 75 is on the outskirts of those arcs. Sorry, encompasses was the wrong term. It's very near Highway 75, is that correct? It's close, yes. And you have then have those phones kind of in the general Levi Carter Park area under subject box two, correct? That's correct. You stated that this was uh, all, in your opinion, this is all on the Nebraska side of Carter Lake? Yes, it would appear to be. And you believe that uh, both phones were co-located uh, in this area until 1017 when they began traveling in a southerly direction and then an easterly direction where they were then uh, located by a tower uh, in Council Bluffs at 1041. Was that correct? Well, I don't have the other time in front of me, but it did, it did move in the direction in which you're describing. I just don't know the time that it arrived there Paul, without looking at the slide, analysis. What page? Next slide. Uh, it arrived there, you can see the tower tags associated with the cell site activations on 5 and 6, uh, beginning at 1028 to 1041, as well as 6, you see 1031 there. So it arrives in the area right around 1030 and remains there for a short period of time. And the phone, uh, Ms. Gowan's phone with the number ending in 1583, it could be anywhere within the shaded arc for uh, target number four, is that correct? Or subject number four, number four? It can be. Whenever you're looking at this, if you see the number of tower activations and the uh, time and advance measurements on the separate towers, how they overlap there, Commonly, we like to call that kind of like X marks the spot. That's something that we like to see, especially uh, when we're actively uh, tracking a phone. If we have a number of those that cross each other, uh, we have uh, a lot of good experience in locating the devices in the area where they cross over. But it's possible that it's in, within the entire arc. Is that correct? Yes. I'm not directing to you at uh, slide number seven at this point, uh, Special Agent. Uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Wi-Fi texting and Wi-Fi calling as it pertains to uh, historical cell phone analysis. Can you just generally describe how Wi-Fi texting and Wi-Fi calling is able to be interpreted or not interpreted with cell phone analysis? So in the event that you have a <coughs> voice call and it's on Wi-Fi, uh, you're not going to see any cell site information associated with it, and you likely won't see any time and advance measurements with it as well. Uh, the same would apply for text messages. So just so I understand this, if I, if, if I I'll just use me as an example, take my cell phone, turn off my network, and have my Wi-Fi enabled and make a call. That, that outgoing call will not be picked up by any cell tower, correct? It would not record a cell site location, but it will be recorded in the records as a transaction or an event in the records. You will see that in what you can see in these records. But you cannot do any timing in advance to know it, exactly where that was located. Is that more correct? Uh, if there's no time in advance included with it, that's correct. Okay. So... Under these circumstances, that when there is no cell site connection, that can be, as Mr. Forney iterated a number of times, the phone was off, the phone was on airplane mode, or the phone had just no connection to the tower. Is that correct? Correct. It was just not communicating with the network. I don't know in which form or fashion it was not communicating. Uh, it just doesn't have any cell site information populated in the records to map that and illustrate where that might be. And if a person is in an area where they just 
don't happen to have service at that time, you're not going to get any hits or target on a cell phone tower if they don't have any service. Is that correct? In other words, if it's roaming? I'm sorry? Are you asking if the phone is roaming? Yes, if there's no service on it. Well, that would be service. It would be roaming on another network. And at that point, you'd have to go to that provider in which it has a contract with in order to get those records. You would see it then. But when we're talking about it not having a connection to the tower, when we are specifically talking about Wi-Fi texting and, and Wi-Fi calling, that is, that's what occurs is you're not going to have a direct pickup from that tower when they're on Wi-Fi. Is that correct? They just don't produce cell site information with it. Okay. All this analysis that you have uh, talked about today, uh, your last slide, and I don't think we need to go to it, but it, set, it was uh, February 14th, and you had both uh, cell phones associated with Mr. Brammer and Ms. Gowan. Did you do any further historical analysis past the date of February 14th? For which device? For either device. Yes. Okay, and I, I mentioned that and uh, on direct there about how prior to, uh, I believe it was February 14th, there were about 200 events between the two phones. Uh, and then after February 14th, until the end of the records, there were only two. I guess I need to be clearer. Did you do any other uh, historical analysis of Ivan Brammer's phone as far as tracking locations after February 14th, 2023? Not after February 14th, no. And as we're looking at page 7 of your report on the screen here, uh, with the big CS, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but at no point did you have any time advance or any other indication that either cell phone was in the area of the CS marker that you have up there on the screen? No. So there's, there's no indication that either cell phone was in that area? No. I have no further questions. Thank you. Redirect. Agent Howe, if the phones were off, would there be any detail regarding the, the phones around the crime scene location? No, if the phones are off uh, and not communicating with the network, you're not going to have any uh, cell site events in the records to be able to map. No further questions. Thank you, Special Agent. And you're excused and can be released from any subpoena. Next witness. Judge, the state would call Detective John Clark. Good afternoon, Detective Clark. Are you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give is true, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. Mr. Forney. Thank you, Judge. Can you state your full and complete name for the record, please? John Clark. And uh, where, are you, where are you currently employed? With the City of Council Bluffs, with the Police Department. And how long have you been employed with uh, the City of Council Bluffs? Since 1989. Are you currently assigned to any particular unit or division within Council Bluffs Police Department? I am. I'm with the Criminal Investigation Division as a detective. Is that often the acronym for that CID? <clears throat> yes. What types of cases do you investigate? Currently, I do digital forensics for the department, uh, but I will also have cases assigned to me. Uh, also, we have a call-out list, which is rotational. As one detective gets called out, we rotate up. If I would have been at the top of the call-out list when this case started, I very possibly could have been the lead detective on this, as well as still doing digital forensics. What is a digital, or what is digital forensics examination? The examination, what is digital forensics? Okay. What is digital forensics? Digital forensics relates to um, investigations, uh, recovery, 
examinations and analysis of data from digital devices. This often includes computers, cell phones, hard drives, different types of storage media, or IoT, Internet of Things. That would be like your Nest thermostat, Amazon Alexa, that may contain data on the device or data on the cloud. What training do you have as a digital forensic examiner? I currently have in excess of 1,600 hours of continuing training, with a lot of that from High Tech Crime Institute, NW3C, National White Collar Crime Center, NCFI, the National Forensics, National Computer Forensics Institute, which is through the Secret Service, also through the FBI, and NDCAC, National Domestic Communications Assistance Center. What certifications do you have? I was certified by Celebrite with their software and also their physical analyzer, and I also went down to IASIS, which is the International Association of Computer Investigative Specialists, and received certification on cell phones, mobile device. Are you required to have any type of continuing education or continuing training or continuing certification as a digital forensic examiner? You should, and I do a lot of the training currently with NCFI, with the Secret Service. As things change, we always want to stay abreast of that. So as new classes are made, I try to attend those down with NCFI, as well as proctoring. I've proctored two classes this year, which allows me to go down, assist with the class, and if they have new material, learn from that. I approach the judge. You may. And you, it's marked as States Exhibit 14. Do you know what that is? I do. This is my CV showing my training and experience as a digital forensic examiner. Judge, I'd like to offer Exhibit 14. Any objection to 14? No, Your Honor. 14 is received. Can you explain what a phone dump is? Yes. And a better word would be a phone extraction is what I use. If I was to have Mr. Forney's phone that he came to me to do an examination on, one of the first things that I would do is I would document the phone. I would take photographs of the condition of the phone, see what state it's in. Is it unlocked? Is it locked? Then I would use one of my forensics tools to do an extraction of the data off of that phone so I could then look at it and see what information I could glean off of it. And can you tell me, I'm sure there's a lot of information that comes out of the phone extraction. Can you talk about some of the information that comes from a phone extraction? Yes. Some of the basic things that will come out of it, call logs, text messages, chats, social media, pictures, videos. There's a lot of other information that we get from the phones also. There's a lot of databases in those phones, so much so that we can see on some of the extractions where the phone was horizontal, vertical, when you unlocked your phone, when it locked, if you locked it, or if it automatically locked. Things of that nature. Make sense? Can you see when a person actually starts up and shuts down a phone manually? Yes. Were you asked to analyze some of the startup and shutdown data from the defendant's phone? I was. And did you, were you able to generate a report of that? Yes. Did you find any startups and shutdowns for February 13th, 2023? I did. May I approach that? You may. I'm handing you what's marked as State's Exhibit 6B. Do you recognize that? I do. What is it? This is a report that I had generated with startups and shutdowns at the request. And is that of the defendant's phone? It is. And is it from February 13th, 2023? Yes. Your Honor, I'd like to offer 6B. Any objection to 6B? Judge, I have a foundation objection. I don't know how he generated the report. I don't know when the report was generated. I don't know any of this. 
Uh, Forney, um, at this point, I'm going to reserve a ruling on the objection and allow you to make um, a little more foundation on Exhibit 6B. Thank you, Judge. Can I approach? You may. Now, on Exhibit 6B, did you generate this report? I did. And when you generate this report, do you use a specific software? I do. And what is that software? Magnet Axiom, which is a forensic software. It allows me to process the data that we take out of a phone. You have to process it in a tool to be able to see it. Did your department extract uh, the defendant's phone? Yes. And then did you take that data and use that software to, to create that report? Yes, I did. Any, any objection at this point? No, Your Honor. 6B is received. Judge, may I uh, publish 6B, please? You may. <clears throat> Can you please explain uh, what this report is? Uh, this is a report of startup and shutdowns using the software tool, Magnet Axiom. I was requested to see if there was startups and shutdowns. Searching for each one of those, this is what I found during the time frame that was requested. So are we, so can you explain what's highlighted in those rows? Can I stand up? It's because the print's so small. Yes. You may. Thank you. We look at the device uh, Start down shutups. Shut down startups. Over here in yellow, this entire column didn't exist. It would tell me on my forensic software whether it was a startup or shutdown. When I exported the Excel spreadsheet, it didn't say startup shutdown, so it was easier for me and for everybody here if I added that column and included what it was. In yellow, we have device shutdown and startups, and we also have the the event time is UTC minus six. That is universal time coordinated. That is the same thing as like branch time, you know, where the clock always starts at 12, then we go forward or backward based on our time zone. So minus six accounts for central standard time. So this is the correct time that we have over here. Like the first device shutdown is February 13th of 23 at 10.56 a.m. Okay. And so with that phone... With the defendant's phone on February the 13th at 10.56, does this report indicate that, the defen that his phone was manually shut off? It does. And then on row 8 at 11, 11 a.m., 
does that indicate that his device was manually turned back on? It does. And then on 1120, on 213, 2023, does that show that his device was manually shut down? Again, it does. And then on that same day, on 1235, does that indicate that his device was manually shut off? Turned on. Or sorry, turned on. Turned on, correct. Um, I wasn't asked on, no, Eileen's phone. I don't think we ever, we found that. You know, Detective Fletcher was the one who did most of the analysis on the phones, the extractions. Um, he was then off work on an injury status, and that's why I was requested to do this phone here, the analysis on that. But it was my understanding that Eileen's phone we never found. Cross? Good morning. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry, good afternoon. It's been a long day. Uh, it says a number there on record number 11. Could you read that to the jury, please? Uh, number 11, between 14 and 23 at 950, device shut down. So, thank you, Detective Clark. So, does that mean that this phone went from February 13, 2023 at 1235 p.m. Until February 14th at 9.50 a.m.? Yes, if there's no other shutdowns or startups in between then on that record, yes, that would indicate that. So the device was on for nearly 21 hours at that, at, at that time, frame, correct? Yes. No further questions, thank you. No further questions, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Clark, and you are released from any subpoena and excused. Any other witnesses today? Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take that early out that I referenced earlier. Um, and part of this is just the, the scheduling of witnesses and uh, what I anticipate um, are two witnesses tomorrow that are coming from out of town. Um, so we're going to be in recess until, um, if you can come back at the same time, 9 o'clock, and we'll try to be on the, on the record at 9.15 or close as possible to that time, barring some other problems I may have with uh, another schedule. Um, please remember that admonition I've given you. Don't be talking about this case when you go home or at any time. Uh, keep an open mind, and thanks again for not using your cell phones. We'll be back on the record uh, tomorrow morning, hopefully around 9.15, 9.30. We're in recess. All right. Please be seated, folks. And for those of you in the gallery, we're recessed for the day. You're free to go. Um, can I see counsel up at the 